Friends, a good morning to you on this Wednesday, January 13th. Ryan Jesperson here with you. Uh, that uh, was and still is Ayla Brooke and the Soundman, and we're grateful to have you here with us for this edition of Real Talk. We're going to move quick right into this because we've got uh, a news availability uh, for the president of the Alberta Teachers Association. He's got meetings. He's got to be in all day. So Jason Schilling, in just a moment, we want to remind you as we kick off the broadcast that we do so each and every day with the incredible support of our presenting sponsor, Bitcoin Well. 2021 looks to be an unbelievable year for Bitcoin. The storylines here, it booms and then it drops. And what are you to make of it? If you want to make sense of it with a source you can trust, the easiest way to buy and sell Bitcoin is Bitcoin Well. And you can find them online under the Sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com. Real Talk starts now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. All right, so here's the deal. Uh, we're going to be talking to the Prime Minister's uh, newly appointed and, and recently welcomed back into Cabinet Minister Jim Carr, Special Representative to the Prairies, coming up just after 9 o'clock Mountain Time today. Right now, out of the gates on the heels of a release from the Alberta Teachers Association. Everybody uh, in Alberta right now, especially those that are politically savvy, paying attention to this this morning, buzzing about a story that shows that quite literally on Christmas Eve, when nobody was watching, the stockings were carefully hung with care on hearths across Western Canada. Kids sleeping in their beds or trying to, waiting for Santa to arrive. The Alberta government pulled a shyster move, taking control from the Alberta teachers' pensions away, flying in the face of a promise they had made, moving these pension dollars to AIMCO. If you feel like you're lost in the weeds, we need to make sense of this. You want to know what this means? You're a teacher. What does it mean for your pension? Let's find out. The president of the Alberta Teachers Association, Jason Schilling, making time for us this morning. Welcome to Real Talk, and thanks for this. Uh, good morning, Ryan. Thanks for having me on. So I'm paying attention to my social media, uh, you know, mid-evening last night. All of a sudden, it just goes boom as everybody finds out about what happened over the holiday break. Can you break it down for us so people can understand it? Yeah, and rightfully so. Teachers should be um, angry over this. I'm angry over this. It's uh, one of these things that um, the government actually, it, the story goes back to 2019 when the budget came down. 
when they imposed a little section in the budget that said that the investment management of teachers' pensions would be moved from ATRF, um, something that we, uh, you know, have been working with for over 80 years, um, over to AIMCO without any kind of consultation. And uh, as a co-owner of the, the pension plan, along with the government, it, you would think it would be something that they would talk to you about, but there was no indication that this would happen. And so um, it got moved over. And so AIMCO and ATRF, which is the Alberta Teachers Retirement Fund, have been negotiating for about a year about what that investment management agreement would look like. So the investment management's moving over uh, ATRF will still um, administer pensions and still have strategic control, but we were also told that we would have they would have control over um, the investment stuff as well. Um, this thing that came out, the, the ministerial order on December 23rd, it was signed but wasn't um, put out until after the new year. Basically, says that uh, uh, AIMCO and ATRF couldn't come to agreement through their year-long negotiations, and so the government is going to impose this ministerial ministerial order on it. And um, they will have then veto power over some of the decisions that ATRF might make on recommendations for investment. So we, we and, maybe uh, that's that, yeah sorry. sorry, and that's not what we were told. Okay, so um, this may... this all came about yeah. Sorry. Jason, I'm so, yeah. <laughs> a little bit fired up on it, I guess. I think we we have a, we know that's great, and I should get out of your way. I think we have just the, the tiniest little bit of a delay, and I keep stepping on your toes because I think you're done talking. I'll ask, and then I'll get out again. What does this ultimately mean? What does it What does it mean for the Alberta Teachers Association? What's going to be your response? I would imagine something's being drafted right now, if it hasn't been already, uh, from uh, the teachers you represent, your association, to the provincial government, to the finance minister, etc. I mean, where do you go from here? What are the implications? Well, we'll take this to um, our legal team as well to see just what it says and what are the implications are and what our next steps will be. I mean, this just came out like this was just done sort of quietly on the, you know, sort of, as you said, um, as the stockings were hung with care, this was just out there. And then so we just got it. So we need to look at it to decide. But in the meantime, um, teachers are, are writing their MLAs as they should. They should be putting pressure on these MLAs. Um, especially UCP ones who specifically said when uh, this first came out, this bill 22 is what we call it, that don't worry about it. We're doing this. It's going to save money. It's going to do that. All these great things are going to happen from it. Don't worry about it. And uh, you're going to have control over this in some aspects in terms of um, strategic and investment management. And then turned around and, and put in this municipal order that basically says something different. So teachers should be on their MLAs about yet what I think is another um, – um, display of poor leadership. What's ultimately the concern here? Is the concern that that the teacher's pension, which is, uh, you know, for obvious reasons, huge to people, people that have been putting away for this their entire lives, working for this their entire lives, planning to retire at some point on this, that it'll be utilized to advance, uh, you know, ideological investments like what the government's been doing, directing funds to traditional energy? I mean, is, is am I getting to where the concern lies? Well, there's concern about where teachers invest their money. Then we have, um, you know, protocols and procedures around and how we invest with ATRF because teachers have determined that over the years. Part of the problem is that this is um, their pension and it's, this is their pension plan that their co-owners are and have never actually been fully consulted about how this move was going to happen or why this move even happened. And they told us, well, it's to save money. But if they invest the manage the, the funds poorly and we saw AIMCO lose $2.1 billion earlier this year, it could drive up our contribution rates. And our contribution rates are also shared by government. So it also will drive up government's contribution rates. And ATRF has a strong history of outperforming AIMCO. Um, the ATRF board invests invest very well um, to the fact that our contribution rates for the last several years have gone down. And uh, that's amazing in this time and era with sort of the economy that we, going, that we have going on, that ATRF is doing such an amazing job. So teachers have full confidence in a pension plan that they are partners in and have control over. And if AIMCO does a terrible job, essentially teachers of Alberta don't have any means to fire them as their investment manager. Sure. Uh, you tweeted, I'm puzzled that AIMCO, uh, the Alberta Investment Management Corporation, for those that are unfamiliar, uh, I'm puzzled that AIMCO and the government would not accept reasonable terms suggested by the ATRF, the Alberta Teachers Retirement Fund Board, in this matter. You say just because something is difficult or complex, you don't simply impose your ideas, you continue to talk. Was there a indication that, that in, in 
correspondence or in negotiations here that there was an acknowledgement that this might be more difficult or or might not be as seamless as the United Conservatives had hoped and they were they were sort of throwing in the towel so to speak on the process what what leads you to believe that that it may be just because it's difficult or complex what did you see well and first of all puzzled in that context is with heavy sarcasm as well <laughs> um and so i just want to make sure that people know that um yeah i mean this is a, a perfectly good example of of some of the decisions that we've seen made by government that aren't fully thought through when the decision was made. So they back in September uh, or 2019 when the budget came down and they're gonna move this investment management over. Well, it's just not like me moving money from my checking account to my savings account. We're talking about $18 billion that are invested in very um, complex, complicated ways. And so to move this over and to talk about the strategic planning of this investment is a complex deal. And it was taking ANCO and ATRF um, a long time to negotiate this. And because they needed an extension um, further beyond what they had, uh, government just decided to impose this ministerial, ministerial order on it instead. Uh, all right, Jason, I know that you've you've got uh, you've literally you're preparing for meeting any minute now. We're grateful that you agreed to this interview on on short notice. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we heard your voice as we kicked off the show before we start gauging where public opinion is at. Uh, I know you've got to go. Is there anything that we haven't asked you about anything we haven't touched on that you think is a significant deal at this point for the public to be aware of? Well, I think the public needs to make sure that we keep holding our, our MLAs to account. We have seen. Um, a lot of trust and credibility issues over the last several weeks with our MLAs. And we need to make sure that we're holding them to account that they're doing what's best for um, Albertans. And this move over from uh, HRF to AIMCO is not what's best for teachers. And uh, I think government still has time. I know they probably won't do it, but they still have time where they could reverse this decision and, and let it, and let it lie and just, um, let uh, HRF in its strong 80-year history continue to do the work that they're doing. Yeah, Jason Schilling, president of the Alberta Teachers Association. Thanks for doing this on short notice. Have a great day. Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, you bet. Uh, we reached out to to Jason, uh, and obviously, as mentioned, this is is a developing story, as they call it. Uh, and and so he goes, well, he's like, I got to be chairing these. He's got kind of a, you know, I don't say this. I, I don't. I'm not snickering because I don't have to be there. It's just this sound this is like my worst nightmare. He says, I'm, I'm chairing a finance meeting all day. And I went, Ugh. but uh, hey, that comes with the territory. So so he agreed to join us for a few minutes before he chairs this meeting all day, which we appreciate. It means, you know, when you're tuned into Real Talk, you're going to be getting the interviews that matter on the issues that matter. And you're going to be hearing them here first, which is great, including uh, coming up at 930 country music star Corb Lund. Uh, how many fans does Corb Lund have on the prairies? A rhetorical question. Sam Ams, it's a rhetorical question. I think everybody, you know, it's kind of funny when you bring up Corb Lund, a number of things are going to happen. Either people are going to, people are going to start uh, referencing some of their favorite tunes. Like people are, people are talking, someone referenced, you know, we're going to be talking uh, court to Corb Lund about politics, which is unusual. In the video he pushed out on his social channels yesterday, even he said, hey, listen, in his in the way in Corblin talking in the way that only Corblin can. I just I could listen to the guy Cor all Cor day. Corblin gave us a stern talking to in the most sweet Corblin <laughs> in like this kind yeah, of Corblin like he, he, but that's that's that to me is when you pay attention is is when. You know, folks that are typically like, I'm not going to I'm not going to get involved in all the muck and mire on social media, arguing over politics all the time. When when those folks start speaking up, that's when you go. Yeah. So so we've got people are are making jokes about someone said and the blue truck got stuck kind of finding a way, <laughs> finding a way to work a little Corb Lund lyric into Alberta political commentary. Uh, but Corb, in his words, in his words, he's he's pissed off about plans to open pit mine for coal in the Canadian Rockies. Uh, we're going to be talking to him and David Luff. David Luff, uh, under former Premier Peter Lougheed, helped develop Alberta's coal policy back in 1975-76 that was rescinded by the United Conservatives just a short time ago. Luff will join us, and then they're going to be joined by a rancher as well, uh, a cattle rancher, uh, and I'm looking forward to this conversation, Laura Lang. Uh, Laura is actually involved in the lawsuit against the Alberta government, so she said to me when we're booking this, she goes, I might not be able to say everything because I'm involved in a lawsuit. I said, well, I'll tell you what, the audience will be able to recognize that there are maybe limitations to what you can talk about, but I think they'd, they'd be pretty interested, and I know I'd be interested to hear from somebody that's going to be directly affected by this or that fears they're going to be directly affected by this and, and they're actually lawyered up. 
So that's coming up at 9.30. Corblund, David Luff, and Laura Lang. As mentioned, Minister Jim Carr coming up in about 20 minutes. The Prime Minister's uh, special representative to the Prairies, a uh, member of Parliament out of Winnipeg, stepped away from Cabinet for personal health reasons, brought back in by way of the Cabinet shuffle yesterday. We're going to talk to Matt Gurney from the National Post about the Ontario lockdown. Ontario's, they're, they're locked right down now. Basically, sort of essential movement only type directive, grocery store and and that's about it type thing. We'll talk to Matt about the cabinet shuffle yesterday. And then I know that you're very excited about our, our, our 10 after 10 today, 10, 10, yeah. our 10, 10 segment. Are you familiar? Were you familiar with? I was not. Bunsen this, and this Beaker, beca- the this science came dogs? came on my radar last night when I first started reading <laughs> it. Um, some of you guys might have noticed I tweeted a picture of Sophie this morning that said, Sophie's excited for today's episode. I didn't say why. For people who don't know who Sophie is. Sophie is my golden retriever. Who you just adopted. Who I adopted, yeah, over uh, the a, summer. A, a pandemic pup. Pandemic pup. Shout out to In the Woods Rescue up by Peter's River. That's where there we, you that's go. Where I love it. So, so, so we're not going to actually... So here's the deal. So we're, we're talking to... Mm-hmm. Um, so, so you, you guys know Bernie's Mountain Dogs burners, they call them. So the, his burner, this the science teacher out of Lindsay Thurber in Red Deer, Mr. Zed, they call him. Uh, he's going to be joining us about 10 minutes after 10 o'clock today. You, you go, well, why not? Why not five after 10? That's when the interviews typically start. We have to get through the announcements at Lindsay Thurber. Oh, okay. so, so once they get through their PA announcements... Then he's going to be able to join us from their science lab, and and he's going to blow something up today, which I'm really excited about. Uh, PA like, announcements, my gateway drug to broadcasting. Hang on a second. Did you do PA announcements? I did PA announcements. at your high school? Absolutely. So did I. <laughs> Sam. <laughs> the only thing is, I think when you did PA announcements, and, and and you're not a young pup, but you're a younger pup than me. Uh, you probably had like digital technology. Mine was old school. Mine was like push the sticky button, like yeah, hello everybody, like barking through the box. You we know? didn't have a sticky button, but we had like we had real microphones. There was just a there was a plug on the wall that you plugged an XLR cable, which is the regular microphone yeah. cable into, and some voodoo happened and it went over the PA. I don't know where the switcher was or how it happened. I just knew that. That microphone went live when you plugged it. So, in. were you the same delightful Sam Brooks back then that you are today? Did were you? Did you I was probably did, more annoying back then? Did you bring? Did you bring humor? And, and I tried to. You, you brought some yeah. because you're a bit of a you're a bit of a like an improv guy. I I, I try to be able to think on my feet. If something yes. comes to me, it's you know, it's you're it's very good something. at thinking yeah. on your feet, okay. pal. Yeah. Um. So yeah. But but hey, and enough everybody getting along and talking about positivity. Why don't we get right back into what everyone's ticked off about this morning? Uh, seriously, though, folks, uh, let's take a second to remind you that we're really excited to have Kubi Energy back on board as uh, one of our sponsors here and not just any sponsor. Kubi Energy uh, presenting positive reflections each and every Monday morning. We're looking for the videos the photos or the stories that absolutely made your day. You can email them to us at talk at ryanjesperson.com. Make sure you identify positive reflections or Kubi. That's K-U-B-Y each and every Monday. Kubi giving us reason to smile. You know, all of their solar installers are actually certified electricians, which means you can trust the work that they do across BC and Alberta. And one of the things I love about what Kubi does, they look after all the permitting for you, plus all the rebates. Like right now, for example, if you're in the city of Edmonton, you know the city will give you four grand back for your residential solar system. You don't have to do the paperwork. Kubi handles it. Get in touch with them at Kubi Energy. .ca. Also very excited to be partnered up with the team at Dairy Queen in Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. Why am I smiling? The minute I think of Dairy Queen, the minute I get to this ad read, I just start smiling because my mind goes to a place where you walk up to that freezer and you fill your boots, whatever you feel like. You want a big cake with that crusty, like you know that you guys know what I'm talking about, that that bought of those cake, the cookie. Oh, what? Or maybe you're just going to go with something a little more light, like Six Dilly Bars for lunch. Right now, at the Six Dairy that, Queens in North Light West. lunch. <laughs> yes, Six yes. Dilly Bars. Well, hey, man, you could go 12. I mean, if you were really, I mean, you, you okay, could go fair. 12. Because yeah, it's a two-for-one deal. Oh, if you go to the Dairy Queens, put that in the there. Six Dairy Queens, Northwest Edmonton, Sherwood Park, you let them know you're a real talker. Dilly Bars are two-for-one in the boxes of six right now, including their dairy-free Dilly Bars. All right, let's find out what the real talkers are saying live. 
I approach this somewhat uh, trepidatiously because, and listen, hey, we're we're having a little bit of fun today, but there's there's nothing funny about what's going on right now. Alberta's teachers are 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 rightfully ticked off uh, that the Alberta government essentially reneged on a promise, uh, and you're having a, probably a hard time uh, keeping track of which promise we're talking about that the Alberta government reneged on. But they they told teachers that while they were moving their pension over to AIMCO. And to be very clear, by the way, I'm not saying that AIMCO moving funds to AIMCO is inherently bad. Uh, AIMCO had a had a, a tough story, had a tough scenario last year where they they made a bet that didn't pan out, and they lost. You know, off the top of my head, approximately a billion and a half dollars. Let's call it a, approximately on a bad bet. And uh, you take a look at, at. Let me just say, not as an apologist, but as a common sense observer, that a lot of stocks. And a lot of funds and a lot of investments got absolutely buried and demolished last year. So let's keep our perspective there. AIMCO has had a pretty decent reputation uh, across Canada uh, for the past number of years. And uh, in investment circles, at least based on what I've heard from people that know what they're talking about, myself not included. What I think teachers are upset about here is, number one, the provincial government uh, and Jason Kenney on the campaign trail never said anything about touching teachers' pensions. As a matter of fact, any time that the opposition would say, Jason Kenney's going to touch your pensions, he'd, he'd laugh and he'd say, the NDP and their socialist ideology want to convince you we're going to come after your pensions, we're not going to come after your pensions. He said the same thing in a video to Alberta's firefighters. Um, and here they are meddling with the pensions. So you can understand, number one, that's a broken promise. But also, number two, if you take a look at how this government has been investing based on its own direction, well, they're doubling down, they're tripling down on oil and gas and pipeline projects. And I know that a lot of people are getting a little bit nervous about that. If it's your retirement fund and you see this government is bullish, for example, on Keystone XL, right, to the point where it'll invest a billion and a half dollars of Albertans' money and loan guarantee another six or seven billion, you're going, wait a second. Wait a second. That's just one example here, right? So where do you feel or how are you? Where are you landing on this? I'm most curious to hear from from teachers, to be honest with you, for obvious reasons, right? Uh, Julie says this has to be one of the lowest blows uh, from this government. She says from the so-called government. Christopher says the Alberta Teachers Association, the ATA, acts so weak. Christopher says if they really wanted to stop their pension plan being taken away, Flex that union muscle instead of always rolling over. That from Christopher. I've seen a lot of talk from people candidly, uh, people that are they're they're ticked and they're right now saying, you know, and and they're people that I can either look at their bio on social media and, and looks like they're teachers or I know them to be teachers. People saying this is worth striking over. Like people are ticked. Now you also have to wonder: Does the government want to push public servants like teachers or nurses to a point where they do strike? Because then all of a sudden the public opinion can change, right? Public opinion is not always positive towards those that are participating in a work stoppage, right? Oftentimes a government can appear to be standing tough against the public. So we're going to hold the line on spending. And, and these you know lazy teachers that already get three months off and have all these entitlements and make six figures. And, and you know, I'm, I'm speaking hyper in, in with hyperbole here, friends. But, but this is the messaging. This is what you see from government. You know, oftentimes I think government wouldn't necessarily regret a work stoppage because it can play well for them in the court of public opinion, right? Gilles Prefontaine is watching this morning, says, how can any Albertan trust anything that this government's doing? They're lying about everything. You know, they need to be fact-checked. Uh, Fatima says this government continues to be sneaky and corrupt, and they're coming for everyday Albertans. Catherine says this government never consults with anybody. I mean, how can this be prevented? I will say... You know, and, and, and there's opinion and there's fact. The fact here is that when I've been conducting interviews with mayors and reeves uh, from municipalities that are saying we're in real trouble with these property tax breaks that are being given to the big oil and gas players, we're in real trouble. You talk to the rural municipalities of Alberta, you talk to the Alberta Urban Municipalities Association, the RMA, the AUMA, you talk to mayors across the province, you know, outside essentially of Calgary and Edmonton, and they're going to say, uh, th this is really going to hurt us. This is going to hurt us big time. You know, some municipalities are talking about a 700% property tax increase, 700%. And they're trying to get ahead of it, doing interviews on shows like this and shows like my previous show, because they know that their constituents are going to be furious and they want everybody to understand that their hands are tied. And what's the theme there? They go, there was no consultation. 
We're going to be talking about coal mining in the Rocky Mountains today. Corb Lund's going to join us. What's the theme there? No consultation. ATA, pension funds move. No consultation. We're going to be talking tomorrow at 9 o'clock to three fire chiefs uh, across the province. We've got a panel. Three fire chiefs are going to join us. Looking forward to this, uh, including chiefs. Uh, well, if everything works out, I should knock on wood. Be careful to say it, but it looks like we're going to have the chiefs from from Fort McMurray, Wood Buffalo, Wood Buffalo, Red Deer, and Lethbridge. Three fire chiefs will join us. No consultation on changing the 911 dispatch structure in the middle of a pandemic. They're saying it could be a matter of life and death. No consultation. Now, why is this relevant? When the United Conservatives were in opposition, when the NDP was talking about, for example, new park space in the Bighorn, which is where the coal mining's happening now. Huh, huh. What was the drum that the United Conservatives were banging? What was Jason Nixon screaming and tearing his hair out about? What was Jason Kenney losing his mind about? Suggesting the NDP was not, what, consulting with people, right? People have a right to be angry about this. Whether or not you support or do not support the government's decision, we can all agree consultation is a very important part of governing. And this government does not seem to have any sort of desire to consult in any meaningful fashion. I mean, as a matter of fact, you know, some of the mayors that are speaking out here, the mayor of High River in southern Alberta, you know, the overcaffeinated liberal bastion of High River, Alberta. I kid. This is conservative country just south of Calgary. Mayor Craig Snodgrass talking about the Alberta government's decision to rescind the coal policy without consultation with Albertans in council last night. The mayor Of the town of High River, Craig Snodgrass, quote, this whole thing stinks. That's the mayor of High River on this. There's a tread uh, right now trending across Canada on Twitter, trending, hands off my pension. And Barbara Rochelle has a thread that's getting a lot of play right now. Uh, She's a retired teacher, so says her Twitter bio, almost 30 years, a former journalist as well. I'm going to read this. I'm going to read the entire thread. She says, you know, the United Conservatives seemed taken a bit aback at the backlash over their holiday travel. It's the arrogance, the entitlement, the hypocrisy, and I think, worst of all, the sneakiness. Barbara says MLA sitting on beaches pretending they were here in Alberta. When the full force of Albertans' anger became apparent, they said, let us earn your trust. Let us earn it back and let us show you how humble we can be. They groveled. But as ever, the UCP talks out of one side of their mouth as they lie out of the other side. So two days before Christmas, says Barbara, the finance minister, Travis Taves, signs a ministerial order that imposes an investment management agreement between AIMCO and the Alberta Teachers Retirement Fund, the ATRF. In 2019, when Kenny's government forced the ATRF to be managed by AIMCO, Taves, the finance minister, wrote multiple opinion articles, an open letter on Facebook, and spoke multiple times in the Alberta legislature about how teachers' concerns were absolute nonsense. That's a quote. And how the ATRF would still be the ones who had the strategic say in how their money would be invested. He assured us, says Barbara, who, again, as a retired teacher, is drawing on this pension, keep in mind. Quote, AIMCO will invest according to policies set by the ATRF board, Taves promised publicly. But now the imposed agreement states that if AIMCO disagrees with what the Teachers Retirement Fund wants to do, they don't have to follow those policies. AIMCO doesn't have to consult. They don't have to ask permission. And keep in mind, and this is worth noting as well, I know there's a lot of information here. I try to just stick on the pillars, the key points. So when you're having a Zoom beer with your friends or you're talking over the fence to your neighbors, like these are the key points. The key points are are not only can AIMCO override the Alberta Teachers Retirement Fund, but the finance minister, to a certain degree, can direct the investment of AIMCO. Okay? The finance minister, minister can put the screws to AIMCO. So Barbara says, according to the ministerial order, quote, such decisions by AIMCO are not subject to appeal nor arbitration. This directly contradicts what Taves spent so much time promising wouldn't happen and belittling anybody who feared it would. And again, Taves signed this order on December 23rd when teachers in Alberta who had a harrowing fall dealing with COVID at school were all on break. 
Schools ended December 22nd. She says he didn't inform the Teachers Retirement Fund, ATRF, until January 4th when teachers were back online after Christmas. And the news was not released until today, meaning yesterday, when teachers were all back in their classrooms. Again, AIMCO lost billions, says Barb, in 2020 through poor and risky investment decisions. Let me interject to say, in my personal opinion, AIMCO had a couple tough situations last year. They had one really blow up in their face and, and it was publicly consumed and, and they wound up on people's radar. I will say there are smart people, reputable people that work for AIMCO. AIMCO is not a dumpster fire. In my mind, this is more with a broken promise to Alberta's teachers. This is more about them having their pension taken away, moved and misdirected now or directed against their wishes. I am not personally suggesting that because AIMCO is managing these funds, Alberta's teachers are in trouble. AIMCO has carried with repute for many years. Let me just say that. But Barb says, and she's not wrong, they did lose billions in 2020 through risky investment decisions, which is true. She says no teachers wanted to transfer the management of their pensions to AIMCO. You know, the United Conservative Party, this just days ago, was begging Albertans to let them earn back their trust. And they were up to this behind our backs the entire time says Barb. Trust me. This time it's teachers, but don't forget, she says they're coming after your CPP too, your Canada pension plan, which is true. And you can bet they'll be just as truthful on what they're up to then. Barb says, think of working all your life and having a hefty deduction off every paycheck you ever earned going into a fund only to have the government seize it from you, hand it over to what she says are dubious and incompetent managers and lie about what they're doing. Even if you're not a teacher, says Barb La Rochelle, this should concern you deeply. The United Conservatives want to earn back and rebuild our trust. This is not the way. They think a few days worth of hollow apologies pulled the wool over your eyes again. Please let your MLA know it did not in no uncertain terms. And she invokes the hashtag hands off my pension, which is a top trending hashtag across Canada today. You can let me know what you think about this. We're going to be checking in with uh, the prime minister's uh, newly appointed special representative to the prairies coming up in just a moment. Uh, first, I wanted to tell you about the team at St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. They're, they're bracing for an incredible 2021 when it comes to public interest in this jeep lineup everybody's buzzing about it you know oftentimes vehicle vehicle sam i think i'm dead here on my mic vehicle manufacturers sometimes will you know have kind of a a bit of an off year where it's you know the the end of a generation of design <laughs> not going on with jeep right now they're reinventing this lineup and the return of the grand wagoneer has everybody buzzing st albert and sherwood dodge is your home for jeep across the province of Alberta. Speaking of Alberta, the team at Friesen Brothers has been supporting and celebrating Alberta producers for the more than 60 years that they've been operating as a family-owned business across the province. In two months or so, they'll open their 15th Alberta shop right here in Edmonton. Looking forward to that as they feature Alberta beef, pork, turkey, chicken, of course, Alberta milled flour in their famous sourdough, and as often as they can, Alberta producers in the produce section as well. Friesen Brothers is Alberta grown and Alberta owned. Uh, Sam, we're going to get to news headlines very quickly and then straight to Minister Jim Carr. Well, of course, uh, everybody's paying attention to what's going on in the United States today as President Donald Trump faces a second impeachment vote uh, following the January 6th attack, that deadly riot on Capitol Hill, House Republicans, uh, including Representative Jason Smith uh, this morning, some of them speaking out against the impeachment. Uh, Representative Smith calls it reckless and urged lawmakers to put people before politics. Uh, that said, Democratic Representative Jim McGovern said the riots wouldn't have happened, quote, if it weren't for the occupant in the White House. Uh, as news develops, or if it develops as we are live this morning here, we'll tell you about it. If you're listening to our podcast later in the day, you better believe we'll be talking about it Thursday morning. Here in the province of Alberta, a new record set for COVID-19 deaths yesterday. It'll delay the second dose of vaccinations, the province will, up to 42 days after the first shot as health officials and politicians try to manage what they say is dwindling vaccine supply. Uh, Dr. Dina Hinshaw yesterday announcing 38 more Albertans have died from COVID-19 says this demonstrates the need to dispense, dispense as many first doses of the vaccine as possible. 
as the province warns of supply shortages in the future. You know, that gives us a good jumping off point to check in with our next guest. Uh, Jim Carr is a member of Parliament out of the province of Manitoba, the city of Winnipeg. Uh, plenty of federal experience and yesterday returned to Cabinet as the Prime Minister's Special Representative for the Prairies. Uh, Minister Carr, thanks for making time for us live this morning and welcome to Real Talk. Well, it's uh, my pleasure to join you and it's always good to have some Real Talk. Appreciate that. So, you know, you stepped away for, for personal reasons to look after your health and wellness uh, out of cabinet. The prime minister returns you there yesterday. That's that's got to be on a personal note before we talk about your mandate. Significant for you. Well, I'll be a lot busier. Ministerial schedules are uh, morning, noon and night. Uh, and I am very happy to report to you that I've got the energy to do it. And the mandate's a really exciting one for me. I get to represent the prairie around the cabinet table. And as someone born and raised in this part of the world, uh, I have a lot of passion for what we've accomplished and what we're about to accomplish. So this is just a bigger megaphone, more access to decision makers at a regular basis. Uh, but really the same mandate as I had from the prime minister a year ago. And that is to be his eyes and ears in the prairie and to make sure that our view of the world is well expressed around the cabinet table. And I'm very happy to be better positioned now than ever to do that. So if we're going to have real talk, I mean, the reality is and the most recent federal election demonstrated that prairie Canadians don't necessarily, I think, feel an affinity for what the federal government is doing. Strong representation in opposition here with regards to the seats that are held, at least across Alberta and Saskatchewan. So where does your work begin acknowledging that this is a region of Canada that, that typically has somewhat of an, uh, I don't want to say a hostile relationship, but that there's some animosity that exists. I don't have to tell you that. Well, the first thing to do is to acknowledge it and then to Ask yourself, why is that the case? Why were we shut out of Alberta and Saskatchewan? Uh, and I think the reason is that we didn't connect with the voters there. We were not thought to be in tuned or aligned with what matters most to them. So our job is to reconnect. And the way you reconnect is by staying in close touch. You know, in this uh, pandemic moment, People don't go to coffee shops and uh, linger over a cocktail and talk about life and politics in the world. It just doesn't happen. So for me, it's Zoom calls. It's on the telephone. It's not a coffee shop and you don't have the same personal contact. But I have been in constant conversations, Ryan, with uh, people up and down the prairie, uh, from the boardroom to the classroom to the farmer field, uh, to ministerial offices, uh, to have a better understanding of the issues that really matter, and also to connect with voters and with constituents in ways that are measurable and tangible, as I think we have done uh, with some of the programs in response to the pandemic. So I think that the key to reestablishing a political presence since we can't do it in traditional ways on the ground, is to do it by delivering programs and messages that matter to the people of Alberta. The, uh, I suppose one of the, the stories, you know, leading the headlines right now, and, and Minister, we can talk about maybe some of the other work that's flying below the radar. Some of these stories equally as important, but they get dominated by coverage of, of vaccine procurement, vaccine, uh, you know, dispensing to the provinces, et cetera. Right now, you've got uh, Canadian premiers, including Alberta's premier, Jason Kenney, saying we're running low on supply. Our capacity is high. The frontline workers are doing great getting people vaccinated, but we need Ottawa to do better. I mean, is this probably the matter of most urgency uh, in front of you on your desk right now? It's the matter of most urgency for all Canadians, those who are in positions of buying the vaccine. And I was very encouraged to learn, as I'm sure you were yesterday, uh, that we have bought another 20 million doses. Well, that's a very significant number. You know, it's the job of the federal government to acquire the vaccine, to pay for the vaccine. But the provinces distribute it according to their own priority and their own infrastructure. And wherever it's possible for Ottawa to help and work collaboratively with the provinces, we will. Everybody is tired. Uh, this has been going on for 10 months. We all want it to end. 
but wanting it to end will not take us to where we have to be. So it's the vigilance, it's the public health advice that you have been getting very effectively from your leaders in Alberta, and we have getting right across the country. And it's hard to talk about patience when everybody is feeling so impatient, but that is the fastest way out of it. The vaccines will be there, the provinces will distribute them, and the federal government will play its part in making sure that we facilitate in any way we can for the availability of human resources for infrastructure to help the provinces discharge their responsibilities. How would you characterize the, the, the role with regards to what the prime minister has, has, has given you the green light to do or the instructions you've received uh, with regards to ensuring that, that, that this relationship does make tangible progress? I, I don't want to believe that there's this inherent chasm that exists between Alberta and Ottawa that cannot be overcome. I mean, the, you know, the prime minister before our current PM was from Calgary for Pete's sake. Western Canada has seen representation. Uh, there's And there's been strong political leadership out of the province of Alberta. But of course, there's a representation issue. Now, whether we're talking about electoral reform, whether we're talking about representation in cabinet, uh, obviously, you know, no Prairie MPs means really very little representation around the cabinet table. How do you begin to address this? Not quite. There are four MPs from Manitoba. Sure. Sure. Which is fair. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, yeah. you, I, I've heard talk that, you know, I mean, to, to give you a sense of what the scuttlebutt looks like when 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 Senate appointments come up, for example, people suggest, well, hey, you know, maybe 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 Amarjeet so he gets named to be a Canadian senator and then the prime minister can bring him in to sit on cabinet. So you've got somebody from Alberta around the cabinet table. People speculate about all these kind of Laurie Blakeman, all these things all the time. I mean, you know, what sort of options do you explore? What instruction have you received from the prime minister to to try to make tangible progress on on bringing these regions together and and healing this relationship? By delivering effective programs that people know come from the government of Canada and that happened during the pandemic. You know about some of the moves that we've made uh, in oil and gas, the purchase of a pipeline, the approval of other pipelines the development of hydrogen, of LNG. Uh, And by the way, I think that Canada ought to be recognized for sending cleaner energy to Asia to displace coal-fired electricity. I mean, that's something that we ought to be working on more aggressively than we are. Uh, But when I think of Alberta and I think of Alberta Alberta stereotypes, you you know what comes to my mind? Nobel Prize winner researcher Michael Houghton, and I think of what you have been able to develop, which is now a critical mass of expertise in life sciences and biosciences. That's what I think of when I think of Edmonton and the University of Alberta. I think of uh, artificial intelligence. I think of Edmonton as the hub for e-commerce to Asia. I know that we in Prairie Canada are producing what the world needs. And that's not only been true historically, but it's going to be true more and more as we come out of the pandemic. So I like to talk about aspiration and opportunity. I know that there are many, many Albertans who are feeling very, very squeezed by a combination of what's happening in the oil and gas industry and by the pandemic itself. And I know that families are hurting and Canada has been there and will continue to be there. Uh, I know that for some it's not enough, but we have to demonstrate through our ability to understand the issues that are as important and as intense of families being able to pay the bills by businesses being able to keep their employees, uh, that these are front of mind to Albertans as they are to many other Canadians. So uh, what do we do as a government? We relate, we deliver, we listen, we understand, and we know that there cannot be a strong Canada without a strong Alberta. That has been the way we have built our resource economy. That's the way we're going to build the new economy. And it's not going to happen with Alberta at the center of it. And fortunately, You have the entrepreneurs, you have the energy, you have the track record, you have the innovators to lead us and to make that happen. Uh, Jim Carr, our guest, uh, Prime Minister's Special Representative to the Prairies. Jason's watching in this morning. He says, uh, if Minister Carr 
wants to represent the prairies properly, I'd like to know where the electoral reform process is on 2015 being the last election with first past the post that the prime minister promised at that point. Where are we at with that? What would you tell Jason? I would tell Jason that that is a promise that we did not deliver. Uh, and he and other people have a right to be disappointed that we couldn't deliver it. Uh, we're looking at other ways to uh, reform the electoral system to make it easier to access. Uh, but look, I, I'm not going to uh, stare at you through this device and deny that that was a broken promise. It was. And uh, I think that we paid an electoral price among some people, maybe Jason, who thought that that was the most important issue that faces the country or the most important issue for them personally. There are lots of issues. Uh, you're not going to satisfy everybody. And there's a good example where we disappointed many. Does that remain a priority for this government or no? Uh, proportional representation uh, is not a priority at the moment, but electoral reform is. It may not take the shape or the form that uh, uh, Jason would agree to, uh, but it certainly is one where uh, I think Canadians will feel that they have better access uh, to the system. And boy, oh boy, aren't we learning by observing what's happening in other places, just how precious and how fragile our democracy is. People want to be heard and they want to be represented. It's our job to make sure that we maximize those possibilities. Yeah, let me ask you candidly, Minister, ba based on what we saw in the United States. I mean, I remember one of the probably one of the most uh, profound moments, I think, that stuck out to me uh, when President-elect Biden on January 6th was responding to what was happening, what had happened and what was still happening with Washington under a curfew at that time. He, he simply said the words, but it was how he said them. He said, this is the United States of America, you know, implying that people would, would otherwise be looking at this saying, what the hell? Like, if you didn't recognize that it was Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., you would think that it was, you know, somewhere in South America or East Africa or, or Eastern Asia where there's an overthrow under, uh, underway. Um, I think it demonstrated that no country is immune from threats against its own democracy if things are allowed to fester if leaders or people in positions of leadership lack the necessary qualities and, and capitalize on things like fear and anger. I would not say for a second, I doubt you will either, that Canada is immune from this type of threat. I think there's talk about Western alienation. I think that there are some extreme perspectives that come along with that. We've heard about threats to the lives of, of politicians of different political parties. We know that it happens. We've, we've seen the, the so-called lone wolf incidents in Ottawa several times, including against this prime minister, that, that could lead us to believe that Canada could have its own problems and probably does have its own problems. You've got a unique perspective. Uh, I'm certainly not saying that the prairies represent what we saw in the U.S. or vice versa, but your front line against a lot of this feedback, a lot of this anger, a lot of this dissenting opinion and, and, and the sense of alienation, how do you process what you saw in the States and, and how do you think it's relevant to Canada? There's nothing wrong with uh, dissenting opinion. As a matter of fact, it should be encouraged. Uh, it's the very heart of a vigorous and a healthy democracy. But it's when the dissent becomes nasty. Uh, it's when the hyper-partisanship motivates people uh, to take an appropriate action. It's when the opposition becomes the enemy and become demonized by people in political power who want to take advantage of their megaphone in order to diminish others. So there's a line, if crossed, can become a threat uh, to the civility of our democracy. I don't think that we're there in Canada. I think there are uh, edges of it. There are signs of it occasionally. I know as a parliamentarian that when you sit in the House of Commons, it can get heated. Uh, but it doesn't usually get personal. Sometimes it does, and people are, uh, in the wake of it, probably chastised, sometimes even by their own colleagues, maybe by members of their own family even. Uh, but you're right. We can't take it for granted, and nor can we assume that it will never change. And that's why in our own behavior as politicians, 
we have to show that understanding of how tenuous it can be. And also, you know, I'm not right all the time. I make mistakes every day. I have positions on issues that there are a lot of people who are as smart as I am can criticize. And we can have vigorous debates over it. Uh, and that's fine. That means that I have to question myself, others question me, and that keeps us all with an inquiring mind and with some humility. It's when we lose humility and when we don't understand the uh, civility that's necessary for a healthy but vibrant democracy uh, that we can get into trouble. Minister, a lot of Albertans, I think, have, have their hearts in their throats. Uh, I don't have to tell you that pipeline projects are incredibly important to Alberta's economy and to Canada's economy. Obviously, the Alberta government uh, under Premier Kenny making an investment, a bullish investment in the Keystone XL project, about a billion and a half dollars, and then a loan guarantee for much more than that. Now, President-elect Biden has suggested that he may cancel this project. I don't know how realistic that is. My gut instinct is that he won't, but this is very important for a number of different reasons. This pipeline is uh, to Western Canada, to Alberta in particular. What will the federal government do, or what is the federal government doing uh, in consultation with the incoming American administration Administration around these energy projects, most notably KXL? Well, the first comment to make is that we support the project and our support is unwavering uh, and it's been continuous. So there's no ambiguity about that. Uh, you know that we bought a pipeline, Trans Mountain Expansion. You know that we approved the Enbridge 3 line and other pipelines. And we're investing in LNG exports. Uh, the new administration will have a different view of uh, pipeline construction, uh, and no doubt it will have a completely different set of policies on emission control and on climate change. So presumably very early on, in fact, I know in the one conversation that the prime minister has had with President-elect Biden, uh, the subject of Keystone XL has already come up. And no doubt uh, there will be many conversations very early in the mandate of the Biden administration. And our argument will be that energy security and a continental energy strategy means that this pipeline should go ahead. Uh, that's been our position for many years, and it will continue to be. Uh, Minister, in closing, and I'm grateful for your time here, uh, you, uh, after being diagnosed with multiple myeloma uh, during the 2019 federal election, um, obviously took some time to, to fight to save your life. It's amazing to be talking to you here today. You received a stem cell transplant to treat this I form did. of blood cancer. Uh, did your personal experience change or impact your opinion on uh, stem cell technology and, and how might that infuse itself into the work that you do? Well, it sure influenced my view about life uh, and about relationships and about intimacy and how you spend your time. Uh, you know, pandemics are not for extroverts like me, uh, but when you are put in a position where um, through this combination of the pandemic and my battle, uh, you begin to appreciate some of the smaller things in life, like reading a good book, like listening to great music, uh, like having conversations with uh, close friends. And those small things that maybe we take for granted, I don't take for granted so much anymore. I was treated uh, wonderfully by a first-class medical system, Cancer Care Manitoba and the Health, Health Sciences Center, particularly the dialysis unit. I'm grateful for the care that I received and for all the support and affection that came my way and continues to be. So really what I do, Ryan, is I count my blessings and I enjoy every day and relationships maybe more than ever because really that's what counts the most. Jim Carr is a member of parliament out of Winnipeg South Centre. He is the Prime Minister's special representative to the Prairies. We appreciate your availability this morning. It's good to see you uh, looking and feeling healthy, and we'll look forward to future conversations. And I look forward to it, too. And thanks for the invitation, and all the best to you. You bet. Door is always open.
Uh, we're going to be talking to Matt Gurney in just a second. Uh, Matt is a Sirius XM uh, radio host. You've probably read his columns uh, in the National Post. Uh, Ontario in lockdown, the cabinet shuffle yesterday uh, with the federal government. Matt's going to chime in on both of those. Wanted to remind you right now that the team at Alta Moving and Storage is, is ready to help you make the changes you've promised yourself you're going to make this year in 2021. If it involves getting rid of clutter, they can help you out. They can, they can come up with solutions, including long and short-term storage lockers. It's one of the things that they do very well. You've got stuff like, you know, maybe it's that that piano that you just can't bring yourself to get rid of, but you don't have room for it right now. Or, or maybe it's grandma's old flatware, or, or maybe your grandpa's table saw, or, you know, someone's going to write in and say, why does it have to be grandpa's table saw? Why does it have to be grandma's flatware, Jesperson? What's the deal? Hey, I'm speaking based on personal experience, all right? I can use a storage solution and this is what they do best at alta moving and storage they've also got for the moving that can prove to be so stressful for people these pod style containers they drop them off for you drop them off at the new location you load and unload at your convenience check them out under the sponsors tab at ryanjesperson.com that's also where you'll find the team at eden landscaping they fancy themselves to be marriage counselors you know i mean not really not technically <laughs> sam's giggling you feel like i should offer some sort of disclaimer here on this right people are going to go hey is it true that you guys do marriage counseling too? Here's what they do. They take partners, spouses, you know, professional roommates, and they bring them together. And if you're not seeing eye to eye on what your backyard or front yard dream landscape should look like, they help you plan it out using all the latest technology, including Zoom and Google Earth, so they can do it as a, at a distance. And you can find them again online at landscapeedmonton.ca or at ryanjesperson.com. Let's get to Matt Gurney. I'm excited that Matt's been able to make time for us today because he obviously writes a National Post column. Everybody reads him there. He hosts a show on, on Sirius XM. Oh, and also he's right now a dad that's trying to corral the kids who are learning online. Matt, how are you making it all happen? Um, I'm working at night and I'm teaching grade one and grade three during the day. The problem is my kids are French immersion and my oh. French is not even at their level. So like my son's coming up to me and go just a few minutes ago, he's like, what is a goobalette? And I'm looking at that. I'm like, Goob goblet cup. <laughs> And he goes, yes. And then he runs back to his sheet because he has like it's like he's like drawing between like the words and the uh, the pictures. So, yeah, that's that's kind of what it is here. The funny thing is, my wife is a French immersion teacher. She'd really be perfect at this if she was not 30 feet away from me right now teaching her own classes virtually because all the schools are shut down. OK, so hang on a second. So so you're working on your column for the post. Uh, you're off the air now on Sirius XM. Did your show this morning. You're helping the kids with school. You're doing an interview on Real Talk here, live streaming across Canada, around the world, in fact. And your wife is teaching a class all from the same four walls. Yeah, we I, I got to say my, the last year of my life has not been what I've expected it to be. But here we are. And to be honest with you, it's going better than I thought it would. That's not to say it's going great, but it's going better than I expected. Matt, where exactly are we talking to you from? Like, are, are you in Ottawa? Are you in Toronto? Where are you right now? I'm in Toronto. I'm in Midtown Toronto, just uh, a few minutes outside of downtown. Um, I, I, I am literally in my basement. This is my basement hallway because every other room in the, the house has been co-opted uh, to be a classroom. It's funny. I mean, we, we live in this great area where under normal circumstances, the appeal of it is that we're, we're five minutes from parks. We're, we're five minutes from shopping. We're 15 minutes from downtown and all the, uh, the amenities, the, the arts, the entertainment, maybe the odd leaf game. And right now it's it's nothing like you, you can you can go to the park with the new lockdown that's been brought in in Ontario. We're trying to figure out, to be honest with you, if you can go to the park, uh, the rules at this point are very unclear. So, you know, the kind of these four walls, as you've said, for the next little while are, are going to be our existence. The idea is that this new lockdown is going to be 28 days. Here's the thing you see over my my shoulder where it says day 51. Yeah. That's a counter of our last 28 day lockdown. We're on day 51 of 28. Okay. So this is, you know, the next 28 days. I don't know. Uh, we were told originally for the kids, be ready to have a one week shutdown of the schools. And then that got extended to a three week shutdown. And then just yesterday we were told it was going to be three more weeks on top of that. So we're, 
we're just doing our best to keep up with this. So it's it's kind of I mean, in a in a population center like Ontario, it's kind of ridiculous for me to say, how do people feel about this? Because there's millions and millions of people. But what do you do? You pick up on a public that generally speaking is on board with this or do you see that the sort of anti mask or the freedom rallies that that we're seeing oftentimes uh, here in Western Canada? You are. We, we definitely do see some of that for sure. Um, as the premier was saying yesterday when he was announcing the uh, the uh, whatever we want to call this lockdown, renewed lockdown, revised lockdown, the mobility data from cell phones suggests that maybe 30 percent of the population isn't playing ball. And that's interesting because just on, on my radio show a couple of days ago, I was interviewing my friend John Wright. He's a pollster. And I was asking him what is roughly speaking the level of popular support among the Canadian population, not Ontario specifically, but Canadian for lockdown measures. And he said about 70%. So it seems like we've got, if you kind of combine those two indicators, we've got 70% of the population that's still playing ball, still has bought in, doing their best, accepting the sacrifices. And those sacrifices are landing unevenly on some people in particular. It's a hard, hard blow. But then you got 30% of the sacrifice that has decided that they've had enough. And they're going to they're going to they're going to do it their way and they're going to try and get through as best you can. This is a case study in how sometimes 51, you know, 50 percent plus one is enough. Other times you need that super majority to buy in or else you don't actually start to make any progress. We are seeing the last couple of days we've had a break in the relentless growth in cases. It's actually come down a tiny bit. But if you look where we were a month ago, we are 50 percent higher than we were. So maybe the last couple of days have looked better. So the question becomes, is this the start of a good trend or is this a blip that's going to be erased by next week? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, in Alberta yesterday, we hear you know, Alberta is doing a great job, relatively speaking, when it comes to inoculations, getting people vaccinated. Mm-hmm. But we also see close to 40 deaths yesterday. And in our, our chief medical officer of health, uh, Dina Hinshaw, saying this is evidence we need to get as many vaccinations rolled out as possible. It's been an interesting study that of Doug Ford's leadership. I wherever people land, I mean, there have been people that have been supporters of his for many years since his time on Toronto Council. There are people that thought he was kind of, quite frankly, a bit of a bumbling fool for quite some time, thought it was a joke that he was running for leadership at the PCs, thought it was a, a joke or even a disgrace that he was a premier of Ontario. Uh, his detractors did anyway. And, and generally speaking, he's actually polled pretty well. In fact, Alberta conservatives are saying, you know, when comparing the two premiers between Kenny and Ford, Ford's probably taken the win on this one. Would you concur? I think, you know, I I can't necessarily offer expert commentary on how they do kind of relative to each other. I know that Premier Kenny is struggling and I I certainly pay attention to that, but I I don't watch that that closely. But to, to your point about Doug Ford, he's impressed people, I think, with a tone that exceeded expectations, where he has uh, felt people's pain. You know, he, he's often had this reputation of being very, you know, bullheaded, aggressive, uh, all, all attack all the time. And his tone during this has been what a lot of people have not expected. The conduct, though, is, is different. And one of the problems he, he has is that he is constantly reacting instead of getting ahead of this thing, where just last week, you know, even when the numbers, like I said, were relentlessly bad in both case levels and hospitalization levels, and he's saying, well, I want to see a few more days worth of data. He's waiting a few more days to see data where all the indicators lag by 10 to 14 days. You're never going to get proactively ahead of this thing. So I think when this is all said and done and the inquiries and the Blue Ribbon Task Forces and the Royal Commissions are all behind us, there will be a lot of blame that is laid at his feet. But just right now, the tone has made a big difference. And I also think, to be honest, I think a lot of people have COVID fatigue. They've tuned out. They're not paying that much attention, probably beyond a soothing tone and a reassuring message. I don't know how much the broader population is even looking at the details of the response. Yeah, I I agree with you on that, Matt. Let me ask you in closing, um, because my understanding is that you've you've got a kid on on lunch break right now that's going to need the computer back. Like school's about to go back. It's not even that you and Uh I have run. We haven't run out of things to talk about. You've got a kid that needs to get back to class here on this computer. Uh, The cabinet shuffle yesterday uh significant i mean it, we just talked to minister jim carr significant the year that the prime minister has sort of reinstalled this special representative to the prairies talked to him about some of some of his priorities here but there are other big storylines i mean mark garneau into into uh, foreign affairs uh, and uh you know frank 
Nike Bubbles, uh, Francois Philippe Champagne, moves into, uh, you know, we've got moves in transportation. He, he's moving around. Uh, there, there's obviously some changes. Now Deep Bain's out and, and Champagne into that innovation role. Um, all of this, people are suggesting an indicator that there will probably be a spring election. Uh, do you agree? And if so, what are you looking for with regards to a couple of key storylines? Well, one of the storylines, and this is, I, I confess, not the most serious, but anytime Mark Garneau changes jobs, I just want to remind everybody that whatever we want to think about that, we judge that on the sliding scale where astronaut is at the top. <laughs> yes. So like no job he has ever had since is ever going to be as interesting as that That's one. So sure. all he can do is sort of trade laterally second best options. The dude literally flew in space. So good luck to him. And, and don't you think it's cool as well to be, to be a minister of foreign affairs that spent time in space? You're like, nobody has seen more than me. Know your role. Well, yeah, and I mean, like almost anyone else would be like, wow, I'm the minister of foreign affairs at a G7 country. This dude's like, yeah, this is cool. Not quite as cool yeah, as orbiting right. the earth. Um, yeah. Substantively, though, look, um, like I said just a couple of minutes ago, Ontario, one month ago, uh, we have exceeded our COVID case counts and our hospitalization rates by almost 50%. Want to know why I picked that one month figure? Because that is roughly the amount of time between an election being called and an election being held. It is going to be really difficult for any government or any opposition party to feel confident that they can either uh, bring down the government or arrange their own defeat and have any confidence in what the situation for COVID is going to look like 30 days out. And the two provinces that have been struggling with the pandemic, Ontario and Quebec, I hate to say this, and I don't mean to, to, to annoy your, your Western audience here, but Ontario and Quebec are where the Liberals and the Tories are planning to wage the next war. If the Liberals do well in Ontario and Quebec, they win the election. If the yeah. Tories hold their Western base and do well in Ontario, they win the election. No one is going to want to pull the trigger on this thing and then find out, oops, look, our COVID numbers are out of control. And, you know, again, Ontario went from 1,900 a day a month ago to about 3,000 a day now. Our hospitals are reeling. That is the change 30 days can make. 30 days is about how long between a vote called and a vote held. Matt Gurney, a columnist with the National Post. You also read him uh, in McLean's and you can hear him on Sirius XM 167. That's uh, Sirius XM Mornings, where he's the host. That's from 7 to 8 Eastern, uh, 5 to 6 Mountain Time. Matt, it's great to have you on the show. Thanks for this. And, and we'll let you get My back pleasure. to, to the, the organized and controlled chaos that is your reality and the reality of millions of other Canadians. I've got 10 minutes to go under my desk and sneak in a nap. So okay, that's the plan good. now. I'll get out of your way so you can enjoy that. Uh, a dad nap Cheers, coming man. up for Matt Gurney. There you have it. Make sure you read his uh, work in the National Post and give him a follow on Twitter at Matt Gurney. Uh, we're really excited this month to be rolling out a brand new partnership with the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute. Minister Carr talking about AI and tech and innovation right here in Western Canada, right here in the capital, the Metro Edmonton region, Amy, the Alberta Machine Intelligence uh, Institute, amy.ca, uh, partners with companies of all sizes across industries uh, to drive innovation strategy and provide practical guidance and advice. The true potential of AI, of artificial intelligence is unlocked when you build internal capabilities and that's what they do. So whether it's big multinationals like, like Imperial Oil or Shell Scottford or, or whether it's your startup, Amy can work with you using their AI adoption spectrum. Check them out at Amy. That's A M I I dot C A. Also, of course, very happy to tell you about Clean Air Club. I, I feel like if, when it comes to response from Real Talk audience members on companies you're really connecting with, a lot of you are sending us photos of your arrival, your doorstep arrival, your first package of furnace filters. The common theme seems to be they're here already. We just signed up yesterday or a couple of days ago at cleanairclub.ca. They take the hassle and they take the, oh, I forgot about that, out of changing your furnace filters. Check out cleanairclub.ca. Sign up today day and experience their doorstop delivery, saving you money and your family breathing easier. All right. This is a story that everybody's talking about. It's what happens when you shine a bit of a celebrity light on an issue. Now, we've been talking about coal mining in the Canadian Rockies, in particular, the eastern slopes uh, for, for several shows here now on Real Talk. Uh, the government's plan to proceed here, we know, undeterred. 
but will public opinion change or be impacted by this most recent development? Corb Lund is an award-winning recording artist, a songwriter, and a sixth-generation rancher from southern Alberta yesterday releasing a series of videos, or, or rather a series of comments as part of a video indicating his displeasure with this. Uh, we're grateful uh, that Corb has agreed to join us this morning uh, alongside two friends. Let me introduce them before we get this conversation going. David Luff uh, has a 30-year career working with the government of Alberta, then the oil and gas industry. For the past 15, he's worked with industry clients working with proposed resource development projects. He was and is one of the architects of Alberta's original coal development policy and the policy for resource management of the eastern slopes under former Premier Peter Lougheed. And rounding out our panel today is Laura Lang. Laura and her husband, John Smith, own and operate Plateau Cattle Company. It's a third generation ranch located just west of Nanton. Uh, As mentioned earlier, Laura is involved in this recent judicial challenge. In other words, court action against the provincial government related uh, to this mining activity. Thank you to the three of us, uh, three of you for joining us this morning and welcome to Real Talk. Um, Corb, let's start with you. Uh, this video that you released, I don't have to tell you, it's, it's got tens of thousands of views because typically, as you say, you try to stay out of politics. So what prompted you to speak out? Uh, protecting our water. It's got nothing to do with politics. I don't care about parties. I, it's just, I, I don't think we should mess with our water sources and our mountains. So where did, how did this get on your radar in the first place, Corb? Uh, Laura, who's with us today, brought my attention to it. And it's funny because uh, I was aware of the Grassy Mountain controversy, which we would like to point out is a completely separate issue. And, and a lot of people conflate the two. That's also an important issue that, that everyone should know about. But we're not talking about that today. That's one mine. We're talking about 1.5 million hectares in, in the foothills that have been opened up to potential open pit mining by removing the Lougheed coal policy that's been in place for 45 years. So there's two separate issues. So we're talking about uh, this category two land, which has up until now been ex- very protected from open pit mines. And so, yeah, I'd, I'd heard a bit about it, but at, like most people, I was a bit foggy about the details, but once I dug into it, it's, it's a pretty big deal. Well, I'm look for, looking forward to hearing your take on this and, and what your fans have been telling you. Uh, David, why don't we get you to tee this up with, with regards to the significance of what we're talking about? You've been uh, intimately familiar with Alberta's uh, coal policy, the policy that was just rescinded because you helped form it under former Premier Peter Lougheed. Will you take us into this in, in layperson's terms that we can all understand why this is so significant right now, the rescinding of this policy? Sure. Um it's really important to remember that uh, Premier Lougheed's vision for the Eastern Slopes and for coal development was based on extensive public consultation with Albertans. That uh, his, his view was that potential development should only be done in a way that maximized benefits for Albertans then and in the future. The vision was that no development would be allowed unless the government was assured that it could proceed without irreparable harm to the environment and that reclamation of any lands developed could be reclaimed and that it was possible to do that. He committed to finding a balance between development and environmental protection. It was all about a quality of life for future Albertans And he recognized, based on what he heard from Albertans, that water protection, recreation, and tourism were the highest priorities to be focused on in the eastern slopes. The coal policy came out in 76. The following year, the eastern slopes policy came out and again restated that watershed and watershed protection were the highest priorities in the eastern slopes that renewable resources were a higher priority than non-renewable resource development, including coal, oil and gas, metallic and industrial mineral development, and so on. So the Kenny government is suggesting (laughs) that the premier's vision is outdated. I would say just the opposite. His vision was prophetic in that Today, the concern about water, water is a very scarce resource in Southern Alberta with climate change and so on. 
watershed and watershed protection is even more important now than it was 45 years ago. Laura, I'm assuming based on the, the geographical location where, where, where you own and operate your ranch, Plateau Cattle Company, just west of Nanton, that, that you're most involved in this or, or most concerned about this because of potential direct impacts on your water supply and on the health of your cattle. Uh, am I right? I mean, how did you get involved in this? How did this first wind up on your radar? I guess, uh, like many of us, um, we, we first learned of the rescission of the coal policy through social media and newsfeed. Um, that's where we first learned of the rescission. Um, very concerning, absolutely. We, we say we're impacted because the uh, grazing allotment resides within these uh, new proposed areas that David just referenced. And uh, yes, of course, we're directly impacted, but, but I would continue to say that we are all impacted. If we live in Alberta, if we drink the water, uh, if, if we recreate, if we're in agriculture, we're all impacted. So that's really how it first came about. And um, I'd like to start off today, too, in thanking Corb for his diligence and uh, his efforts in really digging up and spending time to educate himself on this very critical issue uh, because it is there's a lot to absorb and as we're seeing with him speaking out a lot of people are learning about this for the first time um, that's part of the issue but there's a lot of moving parts to this that are are extremely concerning and it's hard to wrap your head around it all. Corb, you know, one of the things I think that, that, that I'd like to commend you about with, with regards to the video you released as well is, is, is typically when, 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 when public people, when known people, I'm trying to find other words to use as opposed to celebrities, but when, when, when you look into something, you know you have a voice, you know you have a platform, and you educate yourself on something, you can communicate that very clearly uh, to the millions of people that have enjoyed your music over the years and that have followed you. What were a couple of the key things when you started doing the research for yourself, when you started digging through the receipts, so to speak, what really jumped out at you? You've identified a lack of consultation. What troubles you most, though, about this? And what would you say that, that the average Albertan or the average Canadian really needs to know about this? What's most important in your mind? Well, the scope of it is massive. Like if I've seen a map, I, I should have a link to the map. We should provide that somehow. But the map of what of of the first of all category two land, which has been opened up for for coal leases, which has never been open since seventy six, and secondly within that the map of how many coal leases apparently have already been sold. It's, it spooks the hell out of me. Like it's I and yeah, I didn't know anything about this, and nobody I knew knew anything about it. Ian Tyson didn't know about it. My friend, uh, my friend who irrigates out of the uh, Old Man River and Tabor didn't know about it. So, like I said in the video, if, if there was public consultation, I missed it. But if there wasn't, that's a major problem because this is a huge thing that could affect a lot of people. And the other thing is, it's I feel it's short-term thinking. Like, I, I understand the jobs thing, and I'm sure they meant well, and then they're attempting to improve the economy. I get all that stuff. I mean, I'm not stupid. But it's just not the way to do it. This is short-term, and it's potentially devastating. Like, all you got to do is look 50 kilometers over the border – to Elk River, if Elk Valley, BC, anyone in Alberta, if they want to see our future, just go visit uh, Sparwood or, or uh, anywhere in the Elk Valley where it's been open pit mine and the fish are all screwed up and there's the water is a mess and for what? What has what has really stood out to you with regards to the response to your to your videos and the response to your public statement that you released yesterday? I mean, a lot of people very engaged on it. What's what's resonated with you? Um. Well, I didn't know what the response would be. I thought it'd be split, but it's turned out to be pretty overwhelmingly positive. So, I mean, I, I'm i not Leonardo DiCaprio flying in on a jet here and giving you shit about your resources and going home back to Hollywood, right? I live here. My family's been here since 1898, and I'm a citizen. I'm not speaking as an artist here. I'm speaking as a citizen. And I, in that in that sense, I you know, I care about my career, but it's so important that I, I didn't really give a shit what what effects it would have on that end of things. I just felt it was important enough to speak on it as a, as a citizen of Alberta, citizen and Alberta. Yeah. I mean, you even, you even reference it in your video and you say, Hey, listen, you're like, I get it. You know, I'm a rancher. You're like, I drive pickup trucks. I sing about pickup trucks. I thought it was kind of an endearing part of the video, but, but you know, you, you, you say, I, I, you even in, in, imply your, the potential you say, you know, I, I don't want to have to worry about my career. I don't worry about my career or something like that. You wonder about blowback here. 
Have you had situations in the past where you thought about using your public voice to speak out and decided against? I mean, was there something about this that, that sort of was different than all the other instances? Yeah, the scope of it. Like, I, I've always felt that staying above current events is a valuable thing. I think some, I know I have a lot of songwriter friends that are super involved in every issue that comes down the pike and that's cool. I get it. And I think there's a role to play for those kinds of people, but I've always felt that I can have a greater impact by staying out of that stuff and, and communicating through my music. And I, I honestly think art has, has a, a role to play in people's lives that sort of transcends day to day bullshit. So I've always sort of tried to operate on that plane and mostly have done that, but I think this is important enough that, I, and it's right in my backyard. I mean, our ranch is in the foothills. Like, it's yeah. it's a, it's not only altruistic; it's selfish too. I don't want I don't want coal mines up there. Yeah, fair enough. In, in this instance, I think it's the type of selfishness that everyone would invite. Uh, David, I, I saw a quote from from uh, Alberta's agriculture minister, uh, Devin Dreeshen, who suggested that that when it comes to reclamation from open pit mining, that, that you can kind of smooth over the top of the mountains and sprinkle some grass seed. And, and Minister Dreeshen actually said it might actually be better grazing than it was when you first went in there. Uh, based on your experience, I can't wait for Laura to answer this based on her body language, but, <laughs> but David, let me ask you first, uh, you know, is, is that a thing? It doesn't, it doesn't sound to me like a thing. Is that a thing? No, it is not a thing. You can't, when you take the top off a mountain, you cannot put it back. Mountains, the whole ecology, the environment, it's not just for grazing. It's for wildlife. It's for the rivers and the streams that flow off of those mountains. It's just, it's physically impossible to put a mountain back after you've taken off the top of it. And that's what the Lougheed government was all about. It was very clear in this land that's been opened up, this 1.5 million hectares of land that have been opened up. They were very, very clear and they knew that reclamation of that land was not possible. And so when the agriculture minister says, well, you can throw some grass seed on there and it's gonna work, that's a manufactured landscape. It's not a natural landscape. It doesn't provide a foundation to continue to supply secure, safe water for users downstream. It does not provide for wildlife it doesn't provide for recreation and tourism. The very reasons why the coal policy was put in place in the beginning in 76. Laura, you, you, you kind of bristled uh, when I was uh, talking about the, you know, the reclamation efforts here. I would imagine it's something you've done a bit of reading on. I, I, let, me just, let me just ask you why your posture changed so dramatically when I brought that up with David. <clears throat> well, anybody that uh, ranches or have have cattle know that we're grass managers first and native grasslands uh, throughout Alberta are growing in an in extinction. Um, you, you don't uh, replant native grasslands. Um, you know, as I will agree with David, um, artificial is not reclamation, is not uh, re restoration in our minds. And as David had mentioned, the mountains serve a lot of purpose. They serve flood mitigation. Uh, we've seen it up there in 2013, uh, the, the avalanche of rock and everything that occurred up there. Um, what's going to happen when you change uh, nature's slope? Um, what's that going to look like for everybody here downstream? Um, you know, I, I know High River has recently uh, perked up in concern on what this is going to mean for everybody in, in these surrounding com uh, communities. And absolutely, native grasslands is, is one of our top concerns. Water is the leading one. Uh, and in our environment, I'll, I'll point out that Corb's uh, dealing with a power outage today. And, you know, that's that's due to the big winds and extreme weather we get here. We also have the issue of airborne uh, dust and things that will be brought up, not just uh, distributed through the water. But, um, yeah, I could I could fill your show, Ryan, on on, um, on thoughts on native grasslands and and cattle and the importance of our our um, ranching industry that this province was built on. But uh those statements uh, don't don't ring clear, and for anybody who manages or is our stewards of the land, uh, they I am quite sure would agree with me. 
Corb, it's it's good to know that you were able to 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 maintain this this commitment, this interview here, despite a power outage. I was kind of just I kind of on the romantic side of things, the art side of things. I was just picturing you kind of around exactly. <laughs> I was picturing you around a flickering fire. I just thought maybe this is how Corb Lund rolls. I, I didn't know I didn't know there was a power outage. <laughs> Yeah, just as we were getting ready for this, you know, I'd like to say I didn't catch Ryan who 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 said that about sprinkling glass or grass rather, but I mean that's whoever said that's a, to me that's juvenile. I think a grade ten student, biology student, could un, maybe a ten year old could understand that you can't reclaim the foothills by sprinkling gla- grass on after you rip the top of the mountain off. That's stupid. Yeah, I mean, and I think that there needs to be a little bit more real talk about this. I, I, I think, and 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 by the, it was it was a quote from uh, a town hall meeting with uh, Agriculture Minister Devin Dreeshen, who's a farmer himself. So, um, so there you have it. I mean, that answers the question, Laura. What can you tell us about this legal action? What what are you fighting for? Uh, what are you hoping to achieve? I understand there's probably some things you can't talk about on the advice of your council, but what can you tell us about? What we can tell you is um, our judicial challenge is based on the, the lack of, of consultation uh, as directly impacted within the areas and the impacts this will have on our operation and our livelihood. Um, I would extend that to um, this is this is a is a public issue um, and lack of consultation there. Dove. So ourselves, Rock and Pea and Mac and Rainy Blades, ourselves of Plateau rather in Mac and Rainey of Rock and, uh, Rock and Pea Ranch, uh, we've joined together in this judicial uh, challenge to say um, there has been a lack of proper thought and consultation uh, in moving something this critical uh, to our area forward. Uh, so that's that's the premise of it. I'll save you all the legalese. Um, we're, uh, we're in the midst of that. And we're seeing, uh, along with the awareness, uh, a growing support and concern for uh, the conversation in this. Uh, it certainly hasn't occurred with the people who live and work in the area. No consultation. It seems to kind of be the theme of this morning's show. Uh, I'm going to ask each of you about citizen action, about a response to this. I mean, what is the call to action? I would say it's safe to say that Corb's videos have put this issue on a lot of people's radar when it otherwise wouldn't have been there. But da- but David, let me ask you. So we've there, there's there are petitions that are out there. I've just retweeted one of them specifically regarding the Grassy Mountain Mine. Uh, people obviously can can contact their MLAs, contact their ministers. We know that lawn signs can be effective in sending a message. We've seen that with the Defend Alberta Parks campaign. Uh, David, what do you th- what do you think uh, former Premier Peter Lougheed would be saying right now? And what do you think members of the public should be doing right now? I think Premier Lougheed would be saying that the process that the Kenny government used to rescind the coal policy was ethically and morally wrong. There was no consultation with Albertans who would be directly and negatively affected. The only consultation that took place was with the Coal Association of Canada and Australian coal companies. The minister disregarded recommendations from their own staff about consulting with the general public because the ministers knew that the public, environmental groups, ranchers like Laura and John, recreationists, they all would have concerns. So the call to action is the government of Alberta should put a moratorium on any future exploration or development in the eastern slopes for coal until such time as all Albertans have an opportunity to voice their concerns and have those concerns heard. Trevor's watching and right now live on YouTube. He says the straight shooting from Corb, the history from David, and the in-depth information from Laura is such a fantastic mix. Trevor says, I've learned so much on this topic in the last 15 minutes. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, Laura, what's what's your call to action uh, for people? What, what would you say that people could and should do about this today? Learn as much as you can. Um, educate yourself. <clears throat> Excuse me. Educate yourself on what it, what is going to happen here. Um, speak to people, reach out to your MLAs, write letters, everything David is speaking about there. We have a very short time here um, to to get in front of this. Um, I would suggest uh, um, that everybody, um, like I say, get educated on this, write letters, speak to um, the local and provincial uh, government. Um, there's an opportunity here to 
share with them that the decision that's been made and is being made and the decisions to rescind the coal policy haven't been the right decision for Alberta or Albertans. And there's a chance to say, okay, we've made the wrong decision here. Um, and so, first of all, we're still in an awareness phase, I think, uh, Ryan, that a lot of people still don't understand the full facts of this is the Mount Livingston range. This is the Old Man River. This is Livingston uh, Falls area. Um, you know, and, and make sure you understand the differences and, and the critical issues that lie in grassy and the critical issues that now face us with the rescission of the coal policy. There's a lot to learn. Just to, just ask Corp. It's uh, wrapping our discussions. You know, you can get in the weeds with this pretty quick. But at the end of the day, you can't restore a mountain. You, you can't get selenium out of the water once it's leached in there. This is a risk that we're just not willing to to take for what looked to be very little benefit here. Um, we need to remember what agriculture and the economy contribute as well. Um, and this is going to be detrimental to the sustainability of our operation and, and human and animal health. Um, you know, we keep hearing, oh, there's noise, there's emotion. I would certainly push back on those government and association officials and say to them, I don't, I don't think you should be condescending and I don't think you should be ignoring public concern and our voices. You should be talking to us. Yeah, I want to I want to let everybody know that we do have a we're going to be talking to Robin Campbell from the Coal Association of Canada. I think that's going to be tomorrow morning. Uh, so we will be following up on this and, and getting his take and putting some questions in front of him. Uh, Corp, uh, this is an interesting comment from Ryan. Ryan Bolin's watching in on YouTube this morning, says I'm very pro resource development. I'm very pro extraction. Uh, the last thing we want to do, though, is end up like Sparwood, B.C., like like Corb said, I'm a trout fisherman myself who lives for bites on the red deer and the old man. Uh, what does this mean for you moving forward, Corb? If, if, I mean, you know, are you, uh, to, to use Ryan's metaphor, are you hooked on this now? Is this something that you can see continued advocacy on? What, what's your call out to your fans across the country and, and most particularly in, in Alberta right now? Well, guitar playing is a lot more fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, but uh, I, I would echo what uh, David and Laura have said. I, call your MLA. I've been told by some, some, some people who are very experienced in the government that calling your MLA is really effective because like, they start to get nervous and they call the ministers and they might even call the premier. But call your MLA. Call your MLA. And, you know, I think that uh, tell them that you want the uh, Lougheed coal policy back. I think what uh, David said is correct. I think, I think the, the policy, basically what it's done is it's provided for – 40 some years, a very strong barrier against anyone even entertaining these ideas. And when you pull that away and yank it out of the way, all that's left is a regulatory board as, as far as I understand. And if they make the wrong call one time, it's too late. It's over. So the, the policy acts as a bulwark. It acts as a, as a barrier to stop this stuff in its tracks way ahead of it, way, way, way before it gets there. And it's moving really fast. Like they're already exploring up there and digging holes and, and, uh, making roads and stuff and laura's right it's 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 the time is of the essence so make a lot of noise and and i would say to the government that admitting mistake is a noble and honorable thing and i think that one of the best things they could do is just take a close look at this listen to the people that have spoken out about it and say you know what guys we made a mistake here uh we're gonna re we're gonna restore the policy and i think it might end up being a very respected part of their legacy I agree with you there. Uh, Corb, let me ask you in closing, uh, people can check out CorbLund.com, your, your album uh, available now, Agricultural Tragic. Uh, a pandemic's been been uh, really tough uh, for, for people that, that work, make their living in the creative arts, most especially those that would love to get out and tour. Uh, what has the last year meant for you? How has it changed the game and, and how are you looking ahead in 2021? Uh, it's been a forced professional development sabbatical. <laughs> I've been taking guitar lessons lots to lots to write about too yeah yeah no kidding uh corb thanks so much for 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 making time for us today we really appreciate it despite a power outage uh great that you were able to be with us uh, david luff uh who does great work and uh as a consultant here and, and bringing us up to speed on the on the details that matter most and of course uh laura uh, laura lang who made this happen uh, she and her husband john smith at plateau cattle company appreciate your advocacy i wish you well in court and uh, I look forward to seeing continued coverage on this based on firsthand testimony, informed testimony like the three of you have brought. Thanks for this real talk today. Thank you. Thank you. 
You can let us know what you think about what you just heard on the text line. Uh, Real Talk uh, RJ, of course, is the hashtag we use. And then when I talk about the text line, <laughs> old habits die hard. I'm talking about our YouTube comment thread that's live. You can sign in on YouTube. And then, of course, your name will show up and you can participate in the conversations that are that are happening uh, here. You know, Ryan follows up. R- Ryan Bolin had said, you know, I'm pro resource development and pro extraction but i'm also an angler uh he wants to be out on the on the rivers that, that including the old man river that could be affected that will be affected by this he says my mla is nate horner um one of, one of you know alberta's first families of politics he says he's called me personally on numerous occasions after i've expressed concerns on his facebook page or by email he's a rancher so i hope he gets this issue i will be calling that from ryan I love this from Heidi, who says, uh, Heidi says, off off a serious topic, says, I was introduced to Corb Lund by way of the Smalls. Uh, they were must-see in Edmonton in the 90s. Heidi says, I have many stories from that era. So do I. <laughs> I've seen Corb Lund play many times, uh, including uh, with the Smalls. Uh, I, I still have my Smalls tapes. I don't have a tape player anymore, but I still have my Smalls tapes and uh, used to love him. I remember one gig way back in the day at Mac Hall, University of Calgary. Um, it was I don't remember all the bands that are there, but I remember two of them in particular. Uh, Corb Lund was there fronting the Smalls and then Placebo was also playing. Of course, Feist uh, was was lead singing for Placebo. So if you take if you take a look at how that evolved, boy, isn't that crazy? Um <laughs> Heather just writes in to say the smalls everybody's talking about it the Bronx and Rod Fest everybody's coming up with their concert memories now so yeah very cool to get Corb Lund on the show my buddy Derek Mitchell down in Calgary will probably never forgive me that I didn't ask uh, Corb or did you notice his name on his zoom camera did you see he's Corby Lund Corby Corby what's Corby. up Corby I decided not to call him Corby I think that's the type of thing you gotta he's, wait he's still on the, he's still watching us and he's, he's enjoying this is yeah. he can we bring him back in are we allowed to bring him back in with his blessing I don't know uh, Corb you know, uh, are you still there? I, I don't know if this is uh, kind hey, of yeah. it's kind of breaking protocol here because we cut you loose and we, we said that you're all done and we thank you for your time. But but I got you here. My, my buddy, my buddy, Derek Mitchell, who's enjoyed uh, hearing you play many, many times. Um, I, I, I think, you know, he went on the record. He said, well, you didn't even ask him to play a bit. Are you going to ask him to play a bit? Derek says uh, and, and I want Derek is a musician himself. So he knows what he's talking about. He fronted a band in Calgary called Mayfly for many years. Oh, yes. Derek said, Derek said, Horse Soldier, Horse Soldier is one of the best Canadian albums of all time. How would you respond to that? He might want to shoot aim a little higher, but I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Well, why don't I just hand things over to you, Corb? Yeah, I never, I didn't see this coming either, but this is, I, I wrote this, uh, what we were talking about earlier. I, I, uh, I saw this movie coming 12 years ago, I guess. <laughs> This is my prairie, and this is my home, and I'll make my stand here, and I'll die alone. They can drill and they can mine all my smoldering bones. This is my prairie, and this is my home. Water's poison, my calves are all dead, my children are sick, the aquifers bled, they want a big pipeline right through the parts grow. This is my prairie, and this is my home. I can't blame the rigor of the boys driving a truck for feeding the uh. family and making a buck. To take a close look at the stock that you own. Because this is my prairie and this is my home. I ain't got the money the lawyers can buy. I don't got my own government's laws on my side. But I got this old rifle that my granddaddy home. This is my prairie. 
This is my prayer. This is my home. This is my prairie, and this is my home. And I'll make my stand here, and I'll die alone. They can drill and they can mine all my smoldering bones. This is my prairie, and this is my home. Absolutely incredible, Corb. We've got, uh, we only have two audience members here on microphone, but Sam Brooks and I will speak on behalf of this uh, entire listening audience, this family that gathers here each and every day and just say an incredible uh, thank you to you, Corb. We so appreciate it. Um, can we bring him back on camera so I can say a proper goodbye? Uh, Corb, I just want to say that that right now on, on our YouTube channel, uh, I think it's important that you hear this. I mean, people, people are like screaming in all caps, just saying, yes, thank you. Awesome. Um, you know, Penny says I'm having a cry in my coffee right now. Kim says I this is a free concert on a rainy morning. I feel like I'm 10 and back on the ranch. Martin says this is a song that reminds him of his father who has passed away. And he says he's got tears in his eyes today. Uh, Euler Country says the song is so sad. Scott says, man, can Corb ever write? And I think our mutual friend, Fish Grakowski, the arts and culture writer for uh, Post Media is watching this. And he says that's one of your best songs he says he was honored to be able to shoot the video for that, and he's grateful that you've been here. This performance, I don't know what to say about it, but a, a real honor, Corb. Thank you again. You bet. Thanks for listening. You bet. That's uh, Corb Lund, uh, a great Albertan, uh, a remarkable talent. Obviously, you can find his album, Agricultural Tragic, at CorbLund.com. I'm, I'm sort of, part of me is like, what just happened? <laughs> what what just happened? I, I like that the like Corb Lund is out in his, his garage or his paddock or his barn or something like that, and he's just got a guitar there ready he's got, to go. How yeah. lucky did we get that his guitar was right there? Yeah. Uh, either that or Corb Lund just has a guitar attached to him at all times, which yeah. is probably true. Yeah. Yeah. That was that was fantastic. Absolutely amazing. And now we're just gonna roll hot right into our next guest. <laughs> this is what a show today. Uh can you Sam, can you get us some video of Bunsen and Beaker? So people can understand exactly. Maybe that long one, there's like that two minute video. And we'll just lay it down here so people can get a, a very clear idea of what we're about to talk about. Friends, if you're if you're streaming audio live on Mixler right now, or if you are listening to this later in the day on the Real Talk podcast, you're going to need to call up Bunsen Burner BMD on Twitter. Uh, this is this is Bunsen, the Bernie's Mountain Dog. They call him Burners. So you get it. Bunsen Burner. OK, that's that's a beautiful burner the Bernese right there and and beaker is uh, in my mind i'm pretty sure it's a golden retriever we're going to find out in just a second but she is an absolute beauty now you're seeing her in in sort of adolescent sort of puppy into adolescent stage she's now a beautifully full-grown pup but these two uh, have have gained international attention for their science advocacy and you're watching you're gonna you're, you're going um, we're just letting this play extended just to make everyone stay even that much better. I mean, you just heard live from Corb Lund uh, by candlelight on Real Talk. This and then this was just add on to that. Uh, you'll go, Ryan. It, it sounded you misspoke there. You you made it sound like the dogs are science teachers. Yeah, they are. As a matter of fact, Bunsen has seventy eight thousand Twitter followers, and 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 Bunsen's on TikTok. And social media, and everybody pays attention to what they have to say about science, including education around COVID-19. It's probably because their human dad, Jason Zakowski, who joins us now live from the Science Lab at Lindsay Thurber High School, is doing an absolutely incredible job with regards to communicating science. Welcome to Real Talk. We're so excited to have you here today. 
Thanks. It's great to be here, Ryan. So we got to you a little bit late because we didn't we didn't know that Corb Lund was going to give us a private show. So it's oh, it's all good. It's been it's been quite a Wednesday morning here. Um, your your dogs are first of all adorable. Uh, was I correct? I better get this right out of the gates. Beaker is is a, a golden retriever. Is that right? Yeah, Beaker is our uh, golden retriever. She is probably six, seven months now. So that video showed she was more of a puppy then. But she's only seven months. She's going to be huge. Uh, I've, I've uh, well, not huge compared to Bunsen. He's a monster. Yeah, <laughs> fair <laughs> enough. So, so you're. I'm, I'm so excited for the next uh, 20 minutes, and I want to thank you, and I want to thank your your principal there at Lindsay Thurber and your students because you've cleared time in the middle of, of a busy day to talk to us, and, and we actually have an experiment coming up uh, live. My understanding, we do. you're going to carry out an experiment for us, which is so cool. But let me ask you uh, before we start talking about COVID, and and before we start talking about some of the the, the, the specific science that you've been helping us. Us, us plebs understand how did how, how did you get your dogs into the science communication biz okay so i'll try and make the story as succinct as possible because it's kind of a fun one um so before bunsen we we had a golden retriever and uh as dogs do they don't live as long as humans and as when we lost her we went through a grieving process and bunsen came along after that and really pulled us out of that kind of dark time as a family. And my youngest son, he's like, what should we call this dog? Cause we hadn't decided on a name. And he had just started uh, learning about, you know, bun- like chemical processes in school. And I can't believe, it, believe I missed it cause I'm a chemistry teacher myself. So a long story short, that's where Bunsen burner came from. Um, and then also I'm a huge fan of the Muppets. So there's also Bunsen honeydew, the Muppet scientist. Right. So there's all of these like puns that go into it. And we started an Instagram account and then went to Twitter and through just like, I guess, a random happenstance, I started to tweet as if Bunsen was a real person on Twitter. And man, did it start to connect with people like they just loved it. And it it allowed me to get away with stuff because he's a dog, but he's a science dog. And, and from that, that there's a whole bunch of humor and like wholesomeness and then cuteness that came from that, as well as incredibly powerful science communication. So let's, so let's get to, let's get to some of the, the examples here, because what I'm really doing here, um, Jason is I'm just looking for excuses to show photos and videos of your dogs. Oh, go for it. I love them <laughs> because yeah. they're amazing. And by the way, such well-behaved dogs, maybe we can leave two minutes and you can talk to us how, how you have such well-behaved dogs. Cause a lot of people are actually going to be, <laughs> a lot of people will respect you, but they'll be super annoyed with you because they'll say, there's no way that my dog would let me put glasses and a lab coat on. Uh, but let's take oh, a yeah. look at, you know, for example, some of the Sam, there's that, that it, the, here we go. For example, <laughs> right. Like you say, Beaker just needs the lab code. Or there you go. I mean, you know, absolutely hilarious. Um, yeah. But let's get into the COVID. You know, the Twitter thread I'm talking about, Sam, there's you did some COVID-19 education. Uh, more important yes. now than ever is people have questions around vaccines, et cetera. You talk about the variants of COVID-19. Uh, Jason, you can see the screen. You can see what our viewers are, are seeing right now. T- take us through yeah. this recent post. <laughs> OK, so. There is just to just to say there's a there's variants of COVID-19 and there's a lot of misinformation out there. People are either way too scared or they're not taking it seriously enough or they just don't know or they don't think it's real. So this thread was just trying to break it down as quickly as possible um, in language that general people will understand. So the first part of it is like a variant of a virus always exists. There's always little changes that viruses make. And you might want to think of that as like a litter of puppies. So that's when Bunsen was really little. That was his all his little brothers and sisters. And people were having a lot of fun trying to find Bunsen in that litter and not necessarily like the science. And then the second picture, I don't know if you have it there. It's yeah, when do. Beaker was really little. <laughs> she was uh, as little retrievers do. Yeah, there you go. She was a little puppy. She was like tugging on my sleeve. And the new variant, the B117 UK variant is uh, more infectious and it's because it binds to our, our it gets pretty complicated, but there's this protein that it, it uh, binds to. And that's kind of like a little golden retriever. But little golden retrievers aren't going to do a heck of a lot of damage. Like the new vi- uh, variant, it's not any more deadly. So that's the, all of the, you know, this may change, right? This situation is really fluid. And then the, th- the third slide is, um, uh, <laughs> right, so this variant can still be stopped by all of our good public health initiatives that, Dr. Dina Hinshaw talks about, all of our epidemiologists talk about, our experts, you know, wash your hands, wear a mask, try not to gather, 
Um, and the, the prevailing theory is these variants are occurring all over the world as we don't vaccinate people quick enough, as we don't reach um, this herd immunity. And we don't want to get to herd immunity naturally because the longer this percolates in human bodies, the greater the probability of these variants showing up. And um, there's more worrisome um, data coming out about the African variant than the UK one. And this just shows, you know, uh, Bunsen going from puppy to adult dog. Um, <laughs> amazing. I can, like I could just look at that for an hour. Uh, Tracy, I could too. <laughs> Tracy's watching live on YouTube right now, says, you know, we need good and effective science education now more than ever, mm. uh, says if it has Absolutely. to, she says if it has to come from dogs, whatever it takes. And, and some random guy, again, the handle, not my attribution, some random guy says science communication can be incredibly difficult because a lot of academics aren't used to talking to the general public about an otherwise very deep deep and complex topic. You found a real yeah. sweet spot there. How does this resonate with your students? Right. So I'd like just to, just to touch on that. I think I have an advantage being a high school chemistry teacher, right? Like I talk to kids all the time and you have to break concepts, very complicated concepts down. Like we teach quantum chemistry, which is mind blowing. And we break that down into something you could teach a kid who can't even drive yet. <laughs> right. Um, so when you use that approach with the public, it's way more effective than, you know, jar science jargon from journals, uh, like for my podcast and for the post that I do, I do research, but those journals, those scientific journals, sometimes I read them and I'm like, I don't even know what's going on in here. And I have a science degree myself. <laughs> Um, I apologize. What was the follow-up question there? Oh, just how it's resonating with your students. We see, obviously, oh, they're, they're big yeah. fans of the dogs, obviously. Yeah, they yeah they love the... So I'm allowed to bring the dogs in um, when we have exam break. Uh, dogs really shouldn't be in our school because there's kids that are allergic, right? And yeah. there are kids that are fear, very, very fearful of dogs. Um, I think some some of them roll their eyes. They uh, they know they're a big deal, but they're like, you know, kid, teenagers are teenagers. They They're more... <laughs> They're more interested in their own lives than their teacher's fake dog life on Twitter. Well, even, even though I think if I add up all of my students' Twitter followers, it would be a, a fraction of what Bunsen's is. Like I was, like I was going to say, like and I, I work really hard on my Twitter, and and Bunsen's got twice the <laughs> followers I do. So, like, you know, what, I know. what are you going to do about it? But, but this is the public speaking. I mean, it it just goes yep. to show that this message resonates with people. When did you know? I mean, I, I should recognize as well. You're the host of the Science Pod. Podcast, P A W D cast yep. podcast, <laughs> and which is amazing, obviously. Um, and and so you yeah. you you've really hit. I mean, when it comes to leveraging digital platforms, social media, accessible communication, uh, the mastery of hashtags, and everything else that you're demonstrating, uh, when did you realize you were on to something? And and who got you there? Like who planted the seed here? And 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 how have you made sure? That, I mean, it's not a joke to get a Twitter following of 80,000 people. That's not something that just anyone can do. Right. Okay. So I'll try my best to answer all of that. Those are, those are all excellent questions. Um, <laughs> so um, when did I knew, when did I know it was going to be a big deal? Uh, so I think when I made a hashtag and it was trending on Twitter, right? Like it was like, cause he's got so many followers, you know, the algorithms of Twitter, if everybody likes a, a thing all at the same time, the, ha the hashtag can be trending or there's like a popular trending hashtag and Bunsen, Bunsen and Beaker will be at the top, right? They'll just shoot right to the top because of the engagement. I was like, wow, this is insane. And, and also we have fans from all over the world. We have people that um, tune in, like listen to him from Australia, the United Kingdom, Africa, the United States. We have a huge American following. Um, and I, it's, it's really heartwarming. I get messages like every day, every day in Bunsen's inbox that are, you know, your, your posts of science and empathy and cuteness got me through the day. It's really rough down here. I was having a bad day and, you know, the dog pictures got them through. Some people maybe have lost a pet or they can't have a dog. Um, so that, that was when I knew it was, a, it was a big deal. As for what planted the seed, I don't know. It was pretty organic. The, the, podcast, was, the podcast came about because Twitter has such a short character limit. I couldn't get across like facts and figures and, and good ideas when I wanted to have conversations. I also wanted to talk to scientists. So my, my podcast has some really, really interesting scientists from all over the world um, and that I have on. And then we do some goofy stuff on it too. Like it's, it's a really fluff. It's not like a heavy science show. It's, it's pretty fluffy. Yeah. I know one of no the, pun uh, intended. <laughs> 
I know. Sam, Sam our producer is groaning over here. But oh, I got so many. I, love I got so, so many. Much of this. Uh, well, yeah. well, I saw yeah, our pal Fish Grikowski, who continues to watch after the Core Blood interview. He says this interview is through the woof. Um, so I, but I, I stopped myself from, from invoking there, there are a lot of uh, puns out there, but I figured that you probably heard them all. Although that, that just challenges me to, to make sure that I, I don't want to let past sort of correspondence wag the dog here. You know what I mean? I want to make sure that I, was uh, that a, does that count? I, I'm doing my best here. No, you're, you're, you're barking up the right tree. <laughs> okay, good. Great. Are we in front of, are you in front of, are you doing this live in front of students right now or no? No. So the okay. students are in my classroom. Um, they are being watched by uh, my principal, uh, okay. vice principal right now. Um, and then when I, you wanted me to do a science thing a little later or whenever, yeah. they're going to come out and watch that off camera. But they this are. is our science. Okay. Yeah, this is our science park. I'm so privileged to teach here. Um, it's this enormous area where all of our students from Lindsay Thurber funnel out into to watch, um, to do labs. Um, there's a class coming by me right now that are going to be working on the microscope. So we have microscopes that go all the way down and um, and in each lab bench, some are chemistry, some are physics, some are biology for dissections. Yeah. So this is the science park at Lindsay Thurber High School. And we're um, talking to amazing. Jason Zakowski, if you're just tuning in, uh, a high school chemistry and uh, teacher in the science department head at, at, at Lindsay Thurber High School in Red Deer. I, I can't say Lindsay Thurber without bristling a little bit because they were always, uh, I, I grew up attending Henry Wisewood High School in Calgary and Lindsay Thurber was always the nemesis when we played. It was Harry Ainley, Lindsay Thurber, yeah. and then us down in Calgary. And so I, I, I but, but I know that there are good things going on despite my long held animosity around <laughs> getting pummeled on the basketball court 20 25 years ago for those of us that that it has been 25 or 50 years since we've been in high school i mean this science lab i don't even know what's in there aside from what you've briefly told us but i can tell it's beautiful how has yep. science uh curriculum and how has have, has methodology of, of education changed over the years and and how are you adapting i mean you strike me as a, as a, you know someone said this guy's a scientist and a teacher uh which is yes. a huge compliment how do you stay on top of it and and how do you make sure that your students are engaged as you are on the things you obviously care so deeply about i would say um i think science teachers role right now is like we have to talk sometimes about current events, meaning that the science miscommunication that's out there, right? We have people in high places of power that have absolutely no idea what they're talking about um, that might say something that is easily proved wrong. And then kids, right, they listen to that. And then we have to say, actually, there's no evidence that this is the thing that could happen. And uh, the COVID stuff has just like magnified that. Um, my big battles, like when I first started teaching was like, maybe the earth is a little older than 2000 years, you know, when we're teaching geology and now it's like, um, coronavirus is real, right? So, um, the, our curriculum in Alberta hasn't changed very much, right? Like there was this big curriculum rewrite and we were hoping to, to have it be mo uh, modernized. Um, but science, teach science teachers are amazing. I'm just one little cog, right? I don't know if your listeners know that, but Alberta science teachers, um, when we look at like the how kids do on tests against the world, Alberta is ranked number two in the entire world on PISA scores. Like the only place that's better than us is Hong Kong, China. Like we're gonna have to find other planets to beat pretty soon to to be better than them in science. Like that's how good Alberta is at science. Um, so I'm I'm just a little cog, right? I do my thing. I I try to make it engaging, but all science teachers try too. Um, so it's in science, it has an advantage, right? Uh, I don't want to put down other subjects, but if uh, kids aren't paying attention to me, I can always blow something up and not go to jail. So, right. So we nobody have that else, advantage. Nobody else has that. I mean, you know, <laughs> you suck on that math, right? Um, yeah. You know, so uh, here's a heart. Let's cut it open. Yeah. All right. Let's, let's, <laughs> yeah. let's, uh, let's shoot a bow and arrow. Like we were doing that a while ago in physics. So. Really? Um, Chad, yeah. Chad is watching in and just is, is pleading with us. Would somebody please leash in these puns. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> James says these dog puns need to stop right meow. Uh, so he's, he's had enough <laughs> of this. Um, let me read you this. Uh, this is, uh, um, Jason, I'm, I'm hesitant uh, in all seriousness. I'm hesitating to put this in front of you. Cause I didn't, I don't want you to put yourself in a position where you, where you get political or you're, you're, uh, you know, but hey, it's real talk and we're live. I didn't ask you to comment on this, but we started the conversation about the Alberta government taking teachers' pensions, moving them to AIMCO, et cetera. I don't know if it's on your radar or not. Um, let me read this comment from a listener. That This is from Shalane, who says, you started the show with a very important issue to teachers, and now you're ending the show with this incredible teacher. 
Uh, Shalene says, I hope it resonates uh-huh. to people how important it is to support our educators. Um, a couple of listeners, more than a couple, are asking me if you'd like to comment on what you're seeing today. I didn't ask you to. That's not why you're here. But I'd be remiss if I didn't ask if that's something that's on your radar right now. Uh, yeah, of course, it's on it's on our radar, right? Like, it's a big deal. Um, I don't know. To, to comment it, comment on to uh, sorry to comment on it in front of a bunch of students. I'm not sure if I feel super comfortable about. Fair that. enough. That's totally fine. <laughs> and and I'm putting you on the spot. And I want to be fair to you. Yeah. Um, we're here to talk about science, and we're here to talk about your dogs. Um, but we're yeah. also here, just like just like Bunsen's account. He our account on Twitter tries to stay ap- apolitical. <laughs> you try to stay the the, the Bernie's Mountain Dog. Uh, typical. They're from Switzerland, aren't they? I mean, doesn't it make sense that he would yep. remain neutral on on all political matters? He doesn't want to go. I always use that as an. <laughs> excuse yeah very yeah, good yeah he doesn't want to get into it okay so so um you know i mean you you said that maybe we could 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 blow some stuff up i mean i i don't know yeah. what you have in mind but do you think we could uh maybe do something that might entertain the real talk audience right now yeah so i had to pick a couple experiments that i knew would work without fail because some of my big i'm like i do science shows like i, I go around central alberta and do, i pre-covid i did science shows and i present at teacher convention so i've got two that are pretty fail safe okay so uh, now i'll have to unplug my headphones and then reposition the thing so no we problem have like a 30 30 seconds or so we can get you right, 30 you know seconds that's no problem okay, and I'll, i gotta put my lab coat on and my uh, protective equipment so. okay so so here we go so, right, so give me 30 seconds yeah don't worry about it you just something. whenever you're okay. ready and uh, sam will work with you to make sure that we make that happen uh, in the meantime we're just going to show you more this is beaker that beautiful girl look at her women in stem Science, tech, engineering, and mathematics. Women in STEM coming at you. I can't believe she's only seven months old. She's, uh, you know, she's, uh, isn't it funny? I'm just hardwired to stop myself from saying she's going to be a big girl. I'm, I just, I just <laughs> threw, threw on the brakes mid sentence. I think it's okay though. I don't think that she's going to mind. This is hilarious. The difference in how the two of them, based on their personalities, watch birds through the window. <laughs> Bunsen on his back. Arr! And Beaker, with a beautiful mind, trying to figure it all out. My Sophie can probably relate to Bunsen a lot better than Beaker, even though she's a goldie. But uh, yeah, the derpy line. You guys still is, hear me? Is, is she's back here. Yeah, we can hear you. We're just, we're just, uh, we're we're just down a rabbit hole admiring your dogs. But let's. Uh, no, you're all good. All right, so let's get back here and let's see. So, uh, so we're in the science lab now for people just tuning in. There we go. And if you're audio, sorry. <laughs> Okay. Can, you, I, can I go? Are we good? You take it away. We're, you, we are your captive audience right now. All right. I've got my uh, Science 10 honor students around here, so I'll just give a quick little science lesson while we do it, if that's all right. That's great. People at home can maybe learn something. Hey, guys, how's it going? This is the weirdest class ever, right? Yeah, okay, super weird. So I've got a water jug right here, and I've already put a uh, type of liquid in it called ethanol. We're going to be talking about hydrocarbon combustions today. Hydrocarbons contain carbon and hydrogen. This experiment is the first one. It's something famously called the whoosh jug. Okay, so the whoosh jug works like this. By shaking this this explosive liquid, I'm turning it into a gas because gases are a lot better to light on fire. (laughs) You guys want to see fire. Make some noise for the people listening. Woo! Okay. All right. There is a slight. Oops. There is a slight chance um, this could just explode. That'll be better for the people watching. Oh, geez. Um, you guys are all sleeping away, right? Okay. Whoosh jug. Here we go. Little bit of activation energy. Fire in the hole. Three, two, one. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Now I got one more, Ryan. It's explosion. Is that okay? Yeah. Is it okay? We got all the time in the world. Let's. Just, oh, let's, I should have done more then. I okay. You know what? On a side note, I'm thinking you just, you, you, he just, you just gave us a great band name, Activation Energy. What a great Activation. name for, yeah, a great name for like a, a three piece metal band. But uh, carry on. Yeah, that's right. Speaking of bands, um, Beaker's in a band on Twitter called 
Vultures of Parliament. Vultures. Have to check it out. Okay. Of course. It, of course. It doesn't make any sense, I know. Of course your dog's in a band. Why wouldn't she be? There's there's merch and there's two real songs coming out. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. This these balloons have hydrogen gas in them. Hydrogen gas when lit. Oh, we've got a whole bunch of people now. Okay. Hydrogen <laughs> hydrogen gas, when you light it on fire, it explodes. But it doesn't have carbon in it, so it won't make carbon dioxide when we talk about burning. If you guys want to film this, this is a really good one in slow mode. Okay? Get your phones out. This is a good one. Follow Bunsen and Beaker on Twitter, everybody. Yeah, if you're, if you're not one of the 80,000 that already do. Yeah. Oh, we could always use more. All yeah. right. <laughs> Okay, fire in the hole. Hydrogen gas. Woo! Woo! Next one. Woo! <laughs> Science! It's Science! Science! <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Uh, Jason Zakowski. That's it. You guys can go back. <laughs> <laughs> that's it he says uh this is these this is gonna be uh we've set the bar this morning with a live live candlelight performance from corb lund and you blowing up hydrogen balloons so i'm not sure <laughs> what we're gonna do tomorrow jason um but uh, me, you can have me back i got one more in my pocket <laughs> oh i guarantee we're gonna have you back as soon as your schedule <laughs> permits um i do know that you have to get to your class we asked you uh to stay with us until 10 30 and we're there now so yeah i gotta go teach some chemistry <laughs> i absolutely love what you do i love how you roll a uh, huge respect from our audience today if you want you can oh, go back awesome. and you can watch this on youtube later and you can see all the comments what people are saying oh cool. um, let, let me just say this i so appreciate it james james i'm going to back away from my microphone to deliver james message because he says you know what you need what you deserve is a rick flair Woo! so i'm going to give that to you on behalf of jason oh yeah uh and uh i'm just about to go hulk up in here but i better not um hey Thank you for this. You're an absolute legend. Jason Zakowski, the students at Lindsay Thurber are lucky to have you. Make sure uh, to our audience that you subscribe to the Science Podcast and follow all three Twitter accounts we've been showing you. Thank you for this. You betcha. Science, empathy, and cuteness. It's going to save us. Science, empathy, and cuteness. That's absolutely fantastic. That's the mantra, and you can see it on uh, Bunsen Burner's uh, Twitter. <laughs> on Bunsen Burner's Twitter. I mean, this is... I, I feel like I have. I have the little... Um, you know those like little kind of like where the tear ducts are. Like I just have a little bit of. I don't like the oh, word. Oh, yeah, the too. word moisture feels like a bit of a dirty word. Moist anyway, but I'm I I have this like from laughing and watching, and I feel like the last forty five minutes here have been something really special. Um, our thanks again to Corb Lund for that live performance. Jason Zakowski, make sure you subscribe to the Science Podcast. We're going to be back to talking coal tomorrow. I think it's going to be tomorrow. We're working on it with his team, but Robin Campbell, um, former environment minister for the province and, and is now basically steering the coal lobby in Canada and in Alberta. And so we'll have some questions for him. Uh, we're also going to be talking to the fire chiefs um, you know, from different municipalities in Alberta, including uh, RM of Wood Buffalo, so Fort McMurray, Red Deer, and Lethbridge. Uh, we do all this each and every day with the support of our amazing partners, including the team at Local Waste. Local Waste is proud to be locally owned and operated and uh, working with uh, startups, small businesses, all the way up to the big guys, malls, grocery stores, coming up with solutions on uh, waste removal, garbage, and recycling. And they want your business so much so that they want you to give them a call, refer to them by their first name. That's right. So Chris and Lauren Labossier want to talk trash with you. 780-242-9746. We're also grateful for another local entity that's going head-to-head -head against the big guys. That's the team at Park Power. They're in the game uh, of electricity, natural gas, and internet. You know, you've got to get it from somewhere. Why not get it from a real talk builder like Park Power? And not just because they profit share with local nonprofits, local charities, but also because they're going to give you 70 bucks off your first bill. All you have to do is check out parkpower.ca and use the promo code when you sign up 2021-REALTALK. Do it today. It takes you five minutes. Save 70 bucks. 2021-REALTALK is the code for Park Power. I wanted to read an email before we go today. 
Actually, I want to read a few emails, Sam, before we go. And uh, one of them, this this was an, an interesting one that kind of jumped out at me. Um, we heard from uh, Dr. Richard Starkey. He joined us on the show uh, several days ago. Uh, I think it was on, was it on the Monday? It was on Monday, uh, I think, when he, when he joined us, uh, right on the heels of that kind of break for the new year. And we talked about conservative politics in Alberta. And uh, he, he, he didn't mince words. Uh, Dr. Starkey, a good friend of the show, also was watching when I talked to Kat Lantain from bloodwatch.org the other day. And Kat was expressing her concerns with Alberta repealing uh, the Voluntary Blood Donation Act. I think I'm probably butchering the name of it, but basically Alberta's law that, that says you can't get paid for blood and plasma donation. And she told us why she's concerned about that. She told us why uh, other groups, including Canadian Blood Services, have advised the Alberta government against this move. This was that private member's bill from Tani Yao, the, the Fort McMurray MLA, uh, the one that he said that, that drove him to a point where he had to get away, so he went to Mexico. Um, I'm just trying to loop this all together with all the storylines that are swirling. Well, Kat painted a pretty uh, dire picture of a, a lack of available blood and plasma when the province needs it. She talked about how the, these private operators come in and they pay for blood and plasma donations, and then they take that plasma outside Canada. She said, despite what the provincial government says, this is bad for Alberta. It's bad for the blood and plasma supply. And a lot of you were very concerned about it. Well, when Dr. Starkey chimes in on something like this, based on his experience in government, we're bound to pay attention. And I wanted to read this from him because we always want you to have all the information uh, this isn't a show that's going to sit here and bang a drum and try to convince you of something while ignoring facts on the other side of the coin or the other side of the equation. We want to have all of the information in front of us. This might seem obvious, but let me spell it out. We want all the information, verified information in front of us so we can form an opinion that's valid, that stands scrutiny. We always want to be scrutinizing what we believe, right? So Dr. Starkey says, you know, I listened with interest to your guest, Kat Lantain, your, your discussion on voluntary versus paid for blood and plasma donations. He says, I appreciate her obvious passion for the subject, but her, her arguments, I mean, quite frankly, he says they're not borne out by facts. He says the, the bill passed by the previous NDP government did nothing to improve the safety and security of our blood and plasma supply. It only made Albertans even more dependent on blood and plasma products imported from the states and other countries where, yeah, you guessed it, donors are paid for when it comes to plasma donations. Uh, Dr. Starkey says, I spoke on this in the third reading of Bill 3 in the Alberta legislature in March of 2017. Uh, for those of you, uh, this is a compliment. Those of you nerds that want to go check the Hansard, uh, the records of, of the legislative activity, March 2017. He says, I also commented in it on a YouTube video. Uh, he said, interestingly, uh, shot by Christine Myatt. Uh, five days after I lost the PC leadership to Jason Kenney, Miss Myatt is now Mr. Kenney's press secretary. I love all these storylines. Starkey says, suffice to say, there are there are two sides, at least to this argument. Three facts remain and are indisputable. So here's what we want to consider uh, as part of this, as we as we sift through the data and form our opinions. He says, number one, no country has been able to supply all of its plasma needs from a voluntary donor base alone. None. He says every country that produces a significant amount of plasma and plasma products relies on paid donors. Number two. It says Dr. Starkey, having parallel voluntary and paid donation systems does not result in the cannibalization of the voluntary donor pool. He says many countries that pay blood and plasma donors have voluntary donor rates significantly higher than Canada's. And number three, he says Health Canada has determined that there is no evidence that blood and plasma products obtained from paid donors are any less safe than blood and plasma obtained from voluntary donors. The argument that products provided by volunteers is inherently safer than that. Uh, from un, or from paid donors, rather, is simply not borne out by facts. He closes by saying, I understand the trauma that victims of the tainted blood scandal suffered in the late 80s, but the recommendations of the Creever Commission are now 30 years old. He says, and, and the commission had no way of foreseeing the vast increase in the use of plasma products for a wide variety of conditions today. Alberta's use of plasma has risen steadily in recent years. Virtually all of it must be imported, mostly from the state's. And while I appreciate, says Dr. Starkey, where Miss Lantain, Ms. Lantain is coming from and her passion, her arguments are not entirely supported by the experience from other jurisdictions. I appreciate that from Dr. Richard Starkey, a former provincial minister, uh, former MLA, of course. And let's wrap with this. Here's a perspective check. The two photos I gave you on short notice from my own Instagram, Sam. I want to end on this uh, to let you know we'll circle back on the coal story tomorrow with Robin Campbell from the Coal Association of Canada. 
David wrote in to say, Ryan, I'm an, I'm an avid dirt biker and I'm a fan of the show. He says, I couldn't help but notice that uh, you've got photos of Jeep XJs. These are the Cherokee, the XJ, we call them, at McLean Creek on your social media platforms. That, that's me, uh, my brother Kyle, my brother Jonas, my sister Megan. Um, and here we are in one of our favorite places on the planet. Uh, this is uh, just west of Calgary, McLean Creek, Provincial Recreation Area. Uh, it's been our McLean, uh, our May Long destination for for about 25 years, uh, and it's an it's an absolutely uh, cherished and precious part of the province for us. I know some of you even even this image is going to infuriate some of you. Um, I'll let you know that I'm also a hiker and an angler. I care very much about this planet. Uh, as a matter of fact, we participate in cleanup efforts when we're out there. Um, and we understand the importance of, of protecting riparian zones of Alberta's waterways. Uh, and we also love getting outside and we love getting dirty and we love making a little bit of noise and we find a sweet spot there. We find a balance uh, like we do in many areas of our life. Uh, David said, uh, so I couldn't notice, I uh, couldn't help but notice your photos, Ryan, the, the off highway vehicle, the OHV community needs, needs a strong progressive voice on this matter, or we will lose access to our recreational areas. He says unfettered OHV recreation is a real problem on the eastern slopes. He says the OHV community, the off-roading community, has done a terrible job representing itself to the broader public. Uh, during the Castle and Bighorn Parks debate, hateful, racist, misogynistic language overwhelmed the debate. David is absolutely right. The RCMP had to come in. Then Environment Minister Shannon Phillips said based on threats to her life, she had to cancel the consultation hearings. It was nasty. David says, I understand that all areas may not be able to remain open or may only be open during certain times of the year, but we cannot lose all access. We need a balanced approach. That from Dave, who says, thanks for your time. Dave, thanks for your email. You can be like Dave and you can send us an email anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Why did I want to read this one? Why did I want to show you those photos? Because I want you to know that each and every day, not just based on the editorial platform of this show, not, not based on the bedrock upon which we have built this, uh, not based on the principles by which we book our guests and present our own opinions, but based on me personally, we promise that we keep it real on this show. So while we talk about open pit mining and, and coal mining, while we talk about natural resource development or pipelines, all things are considered. So I come at it from a position of someone that's very concerned about the environment, that here's ranchers waving the red flags about uh, Alberta's water and, and about grasslands and native grasses, and also somebody who loves a good pallet fire, somebody who loves uh, stomping on that skinny pedal to get out of a mud bog and the whooping and the hollering and everything that comes along with it as well. Approach issues with balance and with perspective and in a real way. And we're grateful that we have an audience that does the exact same thing. If you were inspired by today, how could you not be? If you were infuriated by today in pockets, how could you not be? Tell everybody about this show. Share our YouTube link. Make sure people subscribe and ring the bell. Subscribe to our podcast and rate it. And let us know what you'd like to hear in future shows. We'll be back at it tomorrow morning. Have a magnificent one, and we'll talk to you soon.